OTB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. Good morning to you. Welcome along. It's uh, Thursday morning. Shane, how are you? Good morning. How are things? Oh, Manchester United feeling themselves. They're in their flowers. Well, it's so reactive, isn't it? You lose to, or you draw a Palace late, you lose to Arsenal, but then a little cup win just brings you right back up there. Veg Vag- Horst, he the man. He's a big man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Six foot six. Lovely finish as well. Um, that's what Roy Keane said, you know, this is what he's going to bring. He mightn't score that many goals, but if he scores a few important goals over the six months or the loan signing period that, it, that, that he's there for, then he'll do a job. Henrik Larsson was, was at United for three months. And is that all? I think it was just three months. Right. I think it was January to the end of the March. End of March. Scored a few few important goals. I'd say there's a lot of Man United fans who have uh, Henrik Larsson jerseys. I'd say so. I was there for his last game against uh, Lille at Old Trafford, and it, I think he scored on that night in the Champions League, and came around and met all the fans, got autograph off him afterwards, and all the usual stuff so he was a lovely fella old Henrik uh, but yeah I think he, a bit of a cult hero at Old Trafford although some people probably forget that he ever played with United because it was such a short period Vout could do the same Vout's going to stay though right they're going to buy Vout like well if he, if he scores plenty of goals um, but he's one of the manager's guys he's my, yeah. Yeah, my number one guy yeah but I think they, I think they need someone better better yeah. <laughs> well, I, don't know, you know, I don't think anybody's under any uh, Illusions about that. Right, if you're a Man United fan and you're feeling yourself this morning, we'd love to hear from you. 0879 180 180 is the WhatsApp number. Or, of course, you can uh, get us on the YouTube comments. Uh, you can also uh, tweet us. Now, we're, we're going to cover this story, I think, for one last time this week. <laughs> Adrian Barry, the ghost of Banquo. All week long, the public have been demanding, where the hell is Adrian Barry? And finally, you're here. Here he is. Morning, lads. I don't get the ghost of Banquo uh, reference, but I'm happy to be here. For Jerry's references, you, you, some, I often find you just have to sometimes nod and smile, and then he just moves on. Did you never read a book in your lives, lads? <laughs> <laughs> Nodding and smiling, Shane. Nodding there you smiling. go. Exactly, yeah. yeah. The, the smiling dog. So, Nathan, as um, as one of the only representatives... Sorry, Adrian. <laughs> it's, written, it's written in front of you. 7.32 a.m. on this Thursday morning. Oh, my God. We're going to hit refresh. Yeah. How's the, how's the mood in your WhatsApp groups, Adrian? Um... You, you, what are you talk, What are you asking me about? <laughs> United, United uh, Forest, obviously. United fans. Yeah. Um, I, yeah look, um, obviously, anybody who's watched um, on a regular basis knows I'm a member of Kilmacud, and I would have loved to have been on before now, George, you know, um, but uh, for various reasons, uh, mainly to do with my own sickness, um, I haven't been able to. Uh, I'm obviously not speaking on behalf of the club either, so don't ask me to... Um, Speaking on behalf of the club, obviously I'm not doing that. I am a paying member and very happy to be a paying member. Um, And, you know, in the sense that like, you know, off Broadway, let's call it as we are at the minute, um, I have a good idea of the qualities of the club. And um, that doesn't change regardless of the fact that, you know, Darren Mullen said on the pitch, when he should have come off on uh, on Sunday afternoon, and um, yeah, so and and look, we get into that. Um, what's the mood? I think people are um, look, look, the, the WhatsApp groups are busy, obviously, and people people are on to me given the uh, nature of the conversations um, we've been having on air, and yeah, people are are uh, devastated is one word that's been used, and I do think that like um, nobody. There's been a bit of a like vilification of Croaks and um not 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 on, on one channel alone, but on various channels. And it's all right. Think... Ron Dwyer called us out specifically. You can yeah, you can do the same if you want. No, no, look, that's that that's as it is. Ryan Ron Dwyer doesn't have to see you five days a week uh, for eight hours. So, <laughs> um I'll be more polite about it. But um yeah, I I I it doesn't take into account uh, like by the way, by the way, I, I should say nobody is uh, Croke's not looking for anybody to pat them on the back, of course. Um, but I think the kicks up the ass they've got this week have been probably a little unfair in the sense that, like, they're as entitled to win uh, the All Ireland as Glen are or as anybody else are. They're a club in existence. They're a brilliantly run club. They're a brilliant club uh, to be involved in. The uh, work they do for the community is is off the charts. Um, they engage an awful lot of young people, um, which again, some of users stick to beat them with, and it does feel as if. Like a lot of the commentary is a culmination of 
like a lot of frustration for people over the years, whether it's like an anti-Dublin thing, it's an anti-Croaks thing because the size of the club, it's an anti-Shane Walsh thing because people could just use another stick to, to beat the club with. But I think, Can we yeah, just devastation use... is definitely um, one word that's been used. Devastation, and... is that what you said? Sorry, I interrupted you. Devastation, is that yeah. what you said? It, w- yeah, that, that's definitely w- uh, one tone that's coming through that like people are, um, for the players and for everybody else, like look at nobody has wanted to be in this position. It's an awful position to be in for everybody. And um, yeah, so I think that's, the obviously everybody needs to figure out where, where we go from here. I was at the game on Sunday, um, and I was sat probably about 20 rows back from um, where the Crooks uh, management was. Obviously, uh, I'm an absolute blow-in. Um, I've been there for a year and a half. Um, so my uh, passion for Crooks is still a growing thing in terms of supporting them. Um, my kids are off the charts uh, for them. But um, yeah, I sat about 20 rows back. Um, I was watching Robbie Brennan a fair bit and the management staff towards the end just to see... Um, sort of, you know, what, what the reaction was going to be, obviously, the full-time whistle. You could see events unfolding, and it did look to me, you know the way in the middle of a game, whether you're at it or watching on TV, you have a million thoughts about a million things as the game's unfolding. And there was definitely a thought for me with that substitution towards the end, where I was like, I've only seen one player come off. And I could see Mannion, and I was like, is there not? There is, isn't there? And then you just move on because of the excitement of the thing. Um, and so, yeah, no sort of, obviously, the trophy gets presented, um, there was no sense immediately in the ground at that time that there was anything up. Um, and then we sort of shot out of there fairly early um, and went home. We The kids were mad to go down um, to the homecoming afterwards, so I went down to that. And yeah, at that stage, the murmurings had sort of started around. It certainly wasn't dominating every conversation, but it had started to build and build and build. At that point, obviously, it was doing the rounds in social media. Some people who were at the game had spotted it. Um, and the consequences of it were only starting to really unfold at that stage. Okay, um, I, I do, I do think that uh, there's, you, you talked there in the middle of it, and when I interrupted you, sorry about that. The um, the reasons why this has become such a big story are because it's anti Dub, it's anti Croaks, it's anti Shane Walsh. I don't, I don't think any of that's actually real. Like I, I think that Croaks have built a siege mentality around the whole nobody likes us because we're the biggest, and um, and they resent being called a super club, as do. Uh, Nafina resent being called a super club because they have such big numbers. They think that it's a negative. I, I actually think, like, the, the point you make about they do great stuff for the, the uh, work around um, the community, every GA club has that. Like, every every GA club thinks that about themselves. That is every GA club's identity is like, we're taking young boys and girls away from the street corner and we're giving them purpose and we're giving them skills to deal with life and we're teaching them how to win and lose. I don't know, maybe maybe people resent the fact that any GA club claims that more than another one. Um but I, I it doesn't like I, I don't buy the whole there's a um there's an anti croaks glee to what's going on. I think it's just a question in this in, instance of fairness. Like Well I, I feel like it, if it was the, if it was the other way around the the vilification would have been equal equally as Strong, you know, if Glenn, had but I don't think there's been vilification. I no, no, no. I, I actually reject that there's been vil- vilification. I think that when something unfair happens, you either call it out or you don't. And if you don't call it out, then you don't stand for fairness. Yeah, and I think in this instance, it, it has come down to that. And obviously, we've been attacked uh, by um, supporters of uh, Croaks. I'm not saying members of Croaks, uh, but you know. <laughs> Some members of uh, Croaks have been looking for my phone number late at night from other colleagues of ours going, oh, we want to talk to him. I'm like, fair enough. If you want to talk to me, talk to me. Like, slide into my DMs, lads. That's fine. But I think this is a question of fairness. And ultimately, the rule is really straightforward. If you've got 15 on the pitch, you've got 15 on the pitch. And, and the repercussions are also really straightforward. So, I, like, I think if, if Glennon had 16 on, on the field for the last play, mm. that would have been unfair too. And and they shouldn't have been allowed to win that. I think that like if the Dubs win in All Ireland this year and they've sixteen men on the field against Kerry, or if Kerry do it against Dublin, even against Dublin, I would still say I don't think that's right. And like, I mean, I'm I live in Dublin, but I'm I'm a Kildare fan. Yeah. If Kildare win with sixteen men on the field, it'll break my heart. But we'll <laughs> have to give a replay. Yeah. Mm. Um. 
there's a lot in that. Um, the vilification bit, look, uh, I can understand where they're coming from. They've, like, you know, um, I have no idea that what you're talking about there, but, like, if you're involved in the team or you're around the club, they've been through this. Um, croaks or not, also, yes, that would have been, they currently stand, uh, depending on which side of the fence you fall, they've either won two All-Irelands or three All-Irelands. They're not like a Finbars or a Vincent's or a, um, uh, the, there's, uh, what you call them, Nemo. Um, like they're not like serial winners. This is not like something that 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 um, people are used to coming into the club. And like, of course, I don't. I'm not. I wasn't, by the way, for a second suggesting that they were in any way different or positioned themselves in any way different to any other club. I've on, I've been only there to to say it again a year and a half, and my experience of it has been, um, as I've said a million times, and I'm not just bringing it up now, um, has really blown me away with how they harness the volunteer movement of the community and all that stuff. And I appreciate that they're sidebar conversations, and most people listening to this are saying, yeah, 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 but what about the game? And look, and I get that, but I do think as well, it's also important to give that context. Um, and yeah, look, in terms of the game, there's the two sides to it, Joe, right? There's the stuff that happened uh, on the pitch, the rights and wrongs of that, and there's the stuff that happened afterwards, right? So if you take the first part of that, uh, I'm assuming, and um, I can be as naive as anybody in this, but I'm assuming that uh, it was a mistake on everybody's part. You know, the substitutions are made. There's a mad melee. Michael Verdi, I thought, put it very well earlier in the week. There's a mad uh, sense. I, by the way, I have no idea what it would be like to be on the end of the pitch like that in an All-Ireland final where all hell is breaking loose. And there's a low percentage chance, you have to accept, that Glenn, uh, a chance, but a low percentage chance that Glenn are going to get some sort of a score um, from the 45 and that, again, history is going to repeat itself. So that lends into the madness. So I can see a, a situation where the sub comes on, Mullen doesn't see it, he doesn't come off and he stays on. And then you have the added confluence of the linesman on the, on the, who's come in off the sideline who raises flag for whatever reason, God knows, putting the flag down, and then Glenn take the free uh, quickly. And then at that point, heads are gone from every side. Like, heads are gone from the from the line staff because it appears as if uh, Maliki Rourke was asking for the 45 to be retaken. It would have obviously just done and dusted right there yeah. um, if, if the officials had have agreed to it at that point. So I just think, I think that's the first part, and you'd have to accept that, sorry, my assumption of what happened there is that that was all... Um, really unfortunate and not in the slightest bit delivered. Yeah, and it, it, look, it was a slim chance that Glenn would score. I guess the point is that it's a, not a, yeah. a, a, it's not a zero chance that they wouldn't have scored. Uh, like uh, the other thing is, I suppose you know when you say like, you know whether it's two or three All Irelands now for for Kilmacud is a matter that's that's up in the air. Is there an, is there an element do you feel or think, Adrian, where within Kilmacud that that are saying we're on three now and that's it? Uh, I haven't a clue. Not a notion, like. Genuinely, how how would I know? I do think that I do think that. Um, uh, and sorry, from from the from the people that I've been talking to, who are just same sort of pain club members myself, um, there's certainly there's certainly nothing like that going on. Mm. There's certainly nobody going. That's our trophy, and we're hanging on to it. I've no sense of that. Maybe that's what happens in the end. I have no idea. Um, the but point, yeah, just on that on that second part, then the, obviously. Sorry, on that though, the point about the deliberateness or not, like it, it, it's largely irrelevant. Did they get an unfair advantage in that final play? You know, yes or no, and if it's yes, you go ahead, and if it's no, like uh, then the rule wasn't broken, and, and that's my point. Like, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. There's, exactly, there's exactly. semantics like, around. Uh, they, there's obviously uh, there's been a, a lightning rod. The use of the word cheating. Uh, I I feel like, and we had this conversation with Nathan yesterday, so I don't want to rehash the whole thing. In my opinion. If you get an unfair advantage, that's the very definition for me of cheating in any sport, in any instance, right? Uh, you would disagree with that, I think. And uh, as as has not 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 really, not really. I, I would I don't want to rehash Nathan's argument. Needless to say, I was I was uh, I was leaning towards uh, trending towards Nathan's side that people cheat all the time, and that's that is a part and parcel of sport, as they say. But yeah, the deliberateness of it, I think. I, I know you say it's semantics. I think it's kind of important enough because it does like, speak to the spirit of something. Like, they weren't out to try and shaft somebody. You know what I mean? Like, if Glenn had gone ahead and somehow got a goal out of that, and, like I say, uh, I don't overset it because I don't know, it's a low percentage play. It wasn't like somebody grabbed the ball and dived over the line and, uh, like, absolutely cheated to score a you know, goal to win the game. And <laughs> what are you talking about, Nate? All right. <laughs> <laughs> like, Jesus you, you, Christ. You know what I'm saying? What you, so, yeah, we do. So, I'm just saying it's a... It's a in my view, and well, uh, totally uneducated outside of like um, 
been a in, very interested and regular observer. Uh, I'd have no experience on the pitch. It looked to be low enough percentage. But Shine, like that's that's it, as you, exactly as you say, shouldn't have been 16 players on the pitch. The 17th thing is a total misnomer. It's a technical breach and we would not be having this conversation today. It had been, in terms of the spirit of stuff, it had been incredibly bad form on anybody's part to have been tried to force a replay based on that. So I, th- I think that that's not even a discussion point, to be honest. But yeah, so the second part then is like, you know, everybody gets their time to sit back and like, I would say calmly, but I'm sure that everybody's out uh, celebrating or commiserating, whatever. Um, but everybody gets to calmly sit back and say, what are we going to do from here? And Glenn took their, what was it? three days, three and a half days, whatever it was, to um, make up their mind and push it back to Crow Park. And then suddenly, you know, Croaks um, have to take their own time to think about that. And I think that's fair enough. Like, the game was never going to happen this weekend anyway. So just take the time. Think about what's right for everybody. Um, I'm hoping, personally, that they agree to a replay and that we can all move on with life. And uh, I said to you in the channel earlier in the week, um, my two kids are uh, over the moon um, about the prospect of a return trip to wherever it might be and uh, and the excitement and the flags and the sweets uh, particularly that would follow. Uh, I don't know that that's everybody's um, uh, uh, you know, my kids are probably too young to have been uh, too, uh, to use that word, devastated by it but I'm sure there's uh, other households um, where kids are sort of feeling the heat over. But that's it, like, it's a good chance to sit down, What's that? talk with your kids about yeah. why all this comes about. And It is, isn't yeah. it? It is, it is. I think that's a key point in this, right? And it's interesting that you've, you've got to that point where you think the replay is the right thing to do. We asked Nicky Brennan yesterday, former president of the GA, morally, what's the right thing to do? And he was like, replay. Mm. Like, straight out. And yeah, and it, no one's trying to screw Crokes here. That's the thing. Like, no one is trying to screw them. This is really. But important. I don't think that they're. I don't think. I've no. I've no sense of. I know there was. I, you had a bit of a story yesterday that I. I can't remember. Um, who had written it? That there was some sort of a sense that they weren't going to replay. I. I have no sense. Declan Bogue on. on the on the back of the. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know which paper carried it yesterday was saying that there's there's definitely a mood in in Croaks, you know. Uh, like that has grown to a point of like well I, you know uh, they can like there's definitely there's there's WhatsApps going around. That are purported to be from the the inside the group going. They can take the cup up the road if that's what they want. F- best best to look to them, you know. But we yeah, want the game on like, the field and like uh, heat of the moment stuff too, though, isn't it? Exactly. And I'm going to be. I'm going to show. I hope up to this point I haven't shown too much bias, but I will show a little bit of leaning towards them here and say like, it's a bunch of lads who, as I said, I was down at the homecoming. The the um, sense of occasion and. Um, like I, you know, I, you know, you know where I'm from, Jerry, right? And uh, not Mullingar, the other one, and uh, the county I come from. We don't see too much success, um, so it's unbelievable just to see how all this thing unfolds um, uh, when it eventually happens. And like it's the same for the regular people, member of as you said earlier on a regular club. They're from uh, Dublin. They're from uh, Still Oregon. They're from Donegal. They're from Westmead. They're from Galway. I'm I'm down there every Saturday morning. There are people from all over the country doing unbelievable work. And they're the type of people who are down there um, on Sunday. And and you just look at the team. They're delighted with it. They're generally, geez, I remember the first time I saw them last year when they came back from the Leinster and I saw them up close. I was thinking, geez, here's the under 21s. Uh, the, the senior team must be coming through fairly soon. They're like a bunch of very young fellas. And um, I'm sure they're up and out enjoying themselves. And, and as I said, as much as like I'm sure some of the club members are devastated, I'm certain that the players are too. Like that, you know, consider that they final whistle went, the vast majority of players in the pitch haven't a clue about a 16th player, I'm certain of it, including probably the player involved himself. Uh, I'll actually know he'd come off at that point, so he was probably aware of it. Uh, but the vast majority of players have no idea that's going on. They're celebrating, they're picking up the trophy. So they've been through all that range of emotions. I'm sure at some point after that, somebody somewhere starts to mention it and then it starts to trickle down and then suddenly you're in a slightly different thought process. But you have to consider that there's... Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of people involved in the team itself, apart from anything else, who like you know had been working no harder than anybody else, but equally as hard as everybody else to try and get to that position. And and you can only imagine the devastation that's involved. We'd welcome both up to Clonus if you want to meet halfway somewhere. Maybe Breffney Park is probably a more realistic um, venue, perhaps for a for a game if it's on neutral territory. Like Ryan O'Dwyer was, and look, you, you mentioned it. He, he called us out by name, and he's entirely within his rights to to do that the other day on the other day in the show, and he he disagreed with with what he had said in the morning. And again, he's entitled to that. But like he even said himself, like he disagreed with the the term cheating. 
but then he went on to say, well, I guess by by definition it's cheating, but you know, so that that's why it's so flaky. You know, it it's entirely What's down flaky? to your well, it's entirely down to your own perception of what cheating is. You know, we're, I I I I certainly for one, I'm not going to assume that it, that any of it was premeditated. So. And and that's as you say, Adrian. There's probably levels to cheating. It's not like an Henri situation where someone or someone has died. No, no, no one's saying and, this is U.S. postal. Right? Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, <laughs> good, like good, a, very good comparison. One that cropped into my head. Yeah, yeah. The, the long rainbow here, right? It's, uh, it's very low down on the level of. Spe- of but at the of, same of time, at the same time, I I think that that's a sideshow, and I think that actually it's a handy enough sideshow for everybody involved to go. Oh, we've been accused of something yeah. that we don't feel like we did, and that's the important thing here. And everybody's out to get us, and that bunker siege mentality. Is like oh, it's anti Shane Walsh, it's anti Croaks, it's anti Dubs, and that that's the tone of a lot of the comments. It's like oh, you wouldn't be saying this if it wasn't a Dublin team. Which, like it's because I literally I, I live I yeah. live in Dublin, I live in Dublin for longer than I have anywhere else. But if the Antrim hurlers or the uh, Kildare footballers, who are the two teams that I really support, mm. if they won in these circumstances, I'd be like, you can't, I know. I can't take it. We you would want it. to win. Exactly. No, it's like, but but that's not how that's not our culture in in GA. It is you do whatever it is you have to do to get. If if it's Springfield versus Shelbyville. We will do whatever we can. We'll we'll soak the slithers for a week in brine to make sure that there's heavy balls. I can't even remember which team that was, but that was the story in one of the Munster finals. Like, oh, well, he's a legend. He cheated with the balls. Yeah. In cricket, it's ball tampering. You get banned for years, and you become an outcast. It's true. I, 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 Here like, we're a hero. Like I look, that's a separate conversation. It is, and I, I think out of this, right? Like Jesus, there. Uh, Nicky Brennan hit the nail on the head yesterday. Like there has to be. There just now has to be. And and I take his point about, like, if you introduce one uh, rule for the Ireland final, it has to be for every other game, whatever it might be. But there's a very simple thing you can do, a uh, very simple step to make to ensure this doesn't happen again. And, like, um, you're definitely looking at the officials going, this could have very easily been a, easily been avoided. There's a very easy step to put in, like a soccer style, you come off, you go on, and... Um, I just don't, you know, yeah. I, we need to, that needs to happen now. Like, you cannot <laughs> be back here again. So, uh, bumped into a friend over the last few days who has knowledge of the workings of Central Council. And uh, this has come up in the past. People have suggested well, this. And uh, can't be doing that, lads. Bit too like soccer. Was, well, was essentially, the, 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 it might not have been said openly, but it was like... Suggested. Oh, you know, a bit, a bit soccer, isn't it? Like, oh, we can't have the boards. I mean, you could definitely have the boards. And if the, if that's the case, the chickens have come home to roost. Like, it's true. whoever it is that's saying that, but sure, oh me. yeah, but they they won't know. They're the and same there's chickens. Just, there's nobody they're, squirming. Like, they're, the, they're the pigeons of peace that have come home to roost. But there's nobody Ooh. squirming more than the CCCC this week, and it's it, it's entirely down to their own fault if they haven't decided to adopt change in recent years on this. Uh, that would be central council as opposed to the CCCC. Central council, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who 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 would have had the opportunity, or anybody in fairness in any club could make this move yeah. to try and get the thing on. Um, uh, Congress, and then the other thing is, is apparently there's a there's some there are some nuances in the rule book, which gave the GAA pause for not intervening, which I think is down to, and you really need to know the case law, is down to some somehow in the past these cases have been heard, and uh, like I think when they're talking when they're talking about it, it opening up a whole can of worms, it wasn't actually about every other game being then reviewable. It was more to do with uh, the sentence that they would have to pronounce if they had intervened. I think the only option, really, despite it, uh, I, I don't understand this, but it was explained to me that they would have had to kick Croaks out if they had intervened by the way that the law has been applied in the past. Now, and that would have resulted right. in an appeal, and then you're in the dispute resolution authority, and then all of a sudden it's Murky like territory. weeks and weeks and weeks. Whereas, what I do think is, what I honestly think is, if Croaks had come out immediately after the game and said, this is a mistake. It's an honest mistake. Uh, we're offering Glenn a replay if they think that, that that had an impact on the outcome of the game and we're happy to meet them. And I think in that instance, yeah. the pressure on the from the GA community would have been to Glenn going, well, lads, you can't you can't take that. You, you can't and take like, that. Look, Do you know? I, 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 I don't know what's going on. Sort of. I, I, I hopefully earlier on uh, was trying to give some context as to why I think that immediately after the game might not have happened. Right? Because the they were too busy that, like, celebrating. Well, well, and also, like, yeah, it's not like it isn't the Dublin comparison isn't isn't 
you can't make like Dublin win in a Leinster or even in All Ireland to some degree because like they're just in the habit of doing it. This is like a bunch of you know players in a club who've like you know their second one in whatever whatever number of years it is. It's their second final in, in like they they are high performers. Yeah, second, they do think final, of themselves yeah. as as All Ireland contenders. They are like the best team in Dublin over the last number of years. So I'm not I'm yeah. not entirely on board with the oh their minnows here like and their only victory. I, I'm not. I'm not saying the minnows. I'm not saying the minnows for a second. The 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 idea of the and obviously it's part of the um, um, uh, stated rule book. Obviously, in terms of forfeiting the game, like I do think you would you would have to at that point come back to the spirit of the of the of um, of um, applying that rule. Um, and I think that would be totally unfair. Like as I said, I think kicking them out. Low percent. Oh yeah, totally. Huh? I don't think I. Yeah, I yeah. Nobody really wants yeah. that either. Well, in the immediate aftermath, I was like, "Well, they have to be kicked out because they broke the rules." Uh, as time goes on, you're like, "Well, that would be uh, that. That would seem to be unfair." But actually, you do have to. You, you have to decide either you're for you're for fairness or you're not. And if something well, happens that is outside of the fairness, then the punishment should fit the crime. A, lo- a lot has been made of the fact yeah. that this this happened in a move in the 63rd minute or whatever it was and the game was nearly over. Fergus Kill makes a very good point in the YouTube comments. He says, well, the reaction of being the same at Croke's had 16 men in the field for 15 seconds for a free in the 48th minute. And I, Probably not, but you have to take the context into the fact that it's the end of the game too. Like that, do you though? The facts, uh, yes. the facts, I, I, I think you do. I think the facts are the facts. And like, I think I, 15 you know, seconds though regardless. The, the, the actual play time because the ball goes over the line, Ferris gets the ball and whooshes it away as keepers do. I can't possibly use that ball. I can waste a few more seconds by um, using this other ball. Um, the actual in-play time, because the kick-out is taken and then the ref blows it up. So the actual in-play time is literally the amount of time it takes Glenn to take the 45 and then uh, for it to go wide. It's about seven or eight seconds. So, look, I'm not... Uh, it, 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 there is a chance the ball goes into the back of the net. Ah, look, they're they're the croaks talking points. They're the, they're the talking points. That no, no, that's that, that's I'm I'm, I'm well, not working off any. Uh, okay, any but animals. but they are they are they are the points that have been made immediately by croak supporters on Twitter, and have been magnified and are on the side of like, well, sure, it didn't have any impact. Do you know? Like, that's uh, no, I'm I'm, I, I'm offering a more nuanced view in that. Fair I'm enough. I'm saying that it's a very short period of of time. There is a very small. A possibility that within that seven or eight seconds, yeah, but it doesn't matter. Len score a goal, exactly, exactly. But, but I mean, we, it just we, still, we still bring it up to get it out there to make sure that the point is like in the ether. I think it's. <laughs> listen, if we're going to talk for half an hour, Jerry, we have some, we need to have something to talk about. And I, I must say, I must say that uh, I am, you know, personally, uh, given that I'm a year and a half in the club and um, whatever else I said to, as I said to you, like my um, my my blood doesn't quite bleed purple and gold just yet, and um, you know, but. I would love, uh, I would love a chance for them to go at it again. I think it'd be, um, I think it'd be a great game. I think there'd be so many talking points around it. I think um, as long as everybody's still fit and healthy, and you know, Glass didn't play up to his standards, um, Walsh and Manny didn't play up to their standards. They've now had a, you know, sixty-five minutes um, and a load of drink uh, too <laughs> to, to go at it and and see exactly how it pans out. Yeah, I do. I do hope you know. I think even if they were to play the weekend after next. Uh, if that was the way it was to go, I think at that point, hopefully, that all that would be out mm. of their systems. I'm sure. Uh, sorry, I don't know. I uh, maybe at some point in the week, somebody said to them, "Here, listen, maybe, uh, maybe take it off to put the handbrake on a little bit." But um, yeah, what a what an amazing replay it would be, and I'd love to go out somewhere provincially. Um, Mullingar be a great spot. Clonus for me, but yeah. a, big, a big, big game if it happens. Adrian, good stuff. Thanks very much. Thanks, lads. Cheers. It's uh, our own Adrian Barry there giving us his thoughts. Uh, OTBAM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. The comments continue to roll in. If you've got a view, we'd love to hear from you. 0879-180-180 is the WhatsApp number. Or, of course, you can always get us uh, at Off the Ball AM on Twitter as well. Now, Braeburn Coffee is the official coffee partner of OTBAM. Braeburn Coffee is coming to you, uh, coming to an apple green near you with new Braeburn locations popping up every month. So visit applegreenstores.com forward slash Braeburn. B R A E B U R N to find your native, nearest Brayburn coffee experience. Now, during the ads, you can hear a clip from the latest episode of the Club Championship Show, where manager Pat Hoban, fresh from Ballyhale Shamrocks, winning the All Ireland Hurling Club Senior Championship in uncontroversial fashion, uh, was alongside Will and Ashling to reflect on their win over Dunloy. The Club Championship on Off the Ball is in partnership with AIB, proud sponsors of the Football Hurling and Camogie All-Ireland Club Championships. Check out the hashtag the toughest for more. We're back after this with Paul Ganey. OTB AM This 
is OTB Sports Radio. Have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? It almost feels like we're in the running already and every point, every match is being treated as this great test. There's still half a season to go. I'm not sure how long you can maintain that sort of nervous energy, that emotional intensity. Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app. Pat, is that the dream appointment as a manager when you're looking for a club to go into a club who have won so much but still retain a hunger to get back to Croke Park every year? Like We talk about particularly the success of the last five years and if it hadn't been for COVID in the last minute goal, we could be talking about Ballyhale Shamrocks winning five All-Ireland titles in a row. They're the small margins here. Um, to be able to come into a club, as you say, with so many established stars, youngsters coming through who are very exciting, then you've got someone like Colin Fenley and, say, Joey Holan, who've been 100% committed to their club as opposed to Intercounty over the last year. Like It must be the dream management position to take on. It's the dream management position when you win. Uh, I think uh, in advance of that, it comes with its pressures. It's, it's, uh, I've no doubt the boys will tell you, I don't think we were the first choice management team. So some people maybe felt maybe felt it wasn't the dream job because like that, the expectation is massive with Bally Hale, you know, um, and it was such an important and uh, a year for the club with so many anniversaries and opportunities to make history to do five in a row to go top of the pile with Tuller Owen at 20 titles. So there was pressure there as well. But for our, for me and for James and for Niall, like we just said, hey, this is just too good an opportunity, chance to work with top, top players. And players, you know, we know these players a long time. Owen and Dean are on this call. I've watched them play since they were eight or nine year olds. So we're all familiar with the guys and stuff like that. So just to get that chance, yeah, for as a hurling person, um, stuff of dreams. OTB AM With Gillette Get into your flow With the new Gillette Labs Razor With exfoliating bar You were listening to the voice of Pat Hoban there The manager of the All-Ireland Club Hurling Championship Champions Ballyhead Shamrocks uh, Owen Cody was also on the call that he met, referenced there and uh, the press release came through last night that he's going to be the new Kilkenny captain so um, yeah so congratulations to everybody in Ballyhead as we said controversy free it is a minute past eight uh, this morning and I'm delighted to say uh, Paul Ganey is with us ahead of the beginning of the Alliance Leagues which return this weekend the beginning of the Alliance Leagues represents the dawning of new possibilities for the season ahead with the Allianz Football League standings determining which counties will compete for the Sam Maguire and Talton Cups. Paul, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. I'm good. You're, good morning. you're out injured at the moment, so not actually technically prepping for this game next week. Is that right? Correct, yeah. I just got a small procedure there before Christmas. Um, it was kind of at me all last year. Well, most last year, but mainly in the club side. And uh, I just need to get it tidy up if I wanted to continue at the top level. I probably would have got away with it. Um, at club level for another while um, the extra 10 minutes so on county level and the standard as well so um, just got to tidy it up in uh, another few weeks now and hopefully be back for the bulk of the league but we'll see um, Recovering from injury is obviously one of the worst parts of, of being an, an inter-county player are you better at it this time because you know it's for a specific reason of getting back to that level whereas in your middle of your career you're like oh this is just a pain in the ass and I'm missing out Yeah I suppose um, I think you have Tahi with it now as well having it done the years, just bits and pieces, but and, and some major operations as well. So um I'm plenty experienced with it. Uh it's a lonely place to be, especially the medium to long term injuries. Um but um I know look it's it's probably the best time of year if I was to have something it was it was earlier earlier in the year so that I'll have hopefully a clean bill of health and uh, a good run of it after I get back. So um I'm not I'm not very panicked. I I trust my body as well to to make it back and um, my fitness is generally good and I touch wood now but I don't generally pick up the, the smaller needles and stuff as well during the year so um, I just trust trust the S&C lads to get me back there and um, I, I'll hopefully be, be a warm name when I get back and no, no further needles I think that's the key I suppose when you have a couple of young kids at home Paul it probably helps you not dwell on the, the little injuries and things like that as well Yeah um, it, it definitely does Yeah, the school run now after I get off the phone to you so um we no talk about my injury and how I'm going and how I'll train tonight uh, in the car and the town. There'll be more um, questions about what's this and what's that. <laughs> um, and have I, have I ever heard of a Bakugan? Have you? No, a bottle what? A Bakugan. No. It's an Irish word, is it? Yeah. 
like a Pokemon thing ah, on TV. Right, so. right. <laughs> That's where the interest is at the moment. No, See, kids don't care interest. about medals. They don't care about medals yeah, yeah. or winning <laughs> matches or losing matches. I think Pokemon yeah. is a curse. I, I, uh, and I cursed the day that it entered my life. I, I thought that I, I was finished with it until recently when all of a sudden it has come back and... Um, and uh, we found out a couple of weeks ago that our youngest had brought a fiver in and bought some. I was like, what are you doing? Give him a... Anyway, so... Old, all, old man yells at cloud here. It's all ahead of you. I was a big fan of Pokemon, so... Uh, Where are you? You're, 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 you're indulging yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. uh, not yet, until he gets there, maybe. But um, I, they've all changed too, so I'll be lost, this was. It. There's, there's a million more of them now than there was in my time. Does, there was only 150 when I was growing up, You could collect them all sensible. then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, does no, does no. Young Paddy have a... So it's a Pokemon in one hand, and is it a, a, a football in the other, or is, has football even uh, entered his, his sphere uh, of thinking just yet? Yeah, no, it hadn't, it hadn't really entered his sphere, really, of Barry going to my games and watching me, but um, and the odd training there Sunday mornings. But uh, more and more it's coming now, and, and the classmates are... Big into it as well, uh, so it's 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 nice. And in the winter there in Dingle, they're up in the hall, uh, so they're not freezing up in the field. And um, I well because of different engagements throughout the winter, and, and I wasn't able to make much of it. But uh, the last uh, one or two there, now I've been at, so it's, it's it's good to get up to them. But trying to encourage him a little bit more towards the ball. Now, yeah, it's uh, he's he's just turned six last week, so. Um, it's time for him to to start getting uh, dummy solos, I think, and off the left and right. <laughs> well, you're you're born with a football in your hand, aren't you, Don Kerry? It's, in Dingle, I suppose it's either football or fungi. Yeah, yeah, and unfortunately, fungi's gone. So um, hopefully, it's all football. No, the Comortis I saw at the launch was this week. Um, uh, this is the um, Comortis Pella Paddy O'Shea tournament that's on every year. It, it goes from strength to strength, and it's. Um, it's a, a massive, important event in the area in a generally dead time for tourism. Yeah, it's um, it's it's great how 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 popular it's become as well as a preseason tournament. And that's credit to Padraig there who's driven it on the last couple of years. Um, and do you know what? There's nothing else really happening this time of year, so um, it's great for the area as well because there's uh, I think he brought down thirty plus teams a couple of years ago and. Maybe he's tightened the ship and that a small bit the last one or two years, but um, to have that around and in a in a dead February weekend in, in a small town like Dingle, it's huge for the area um, and it gets it, it it provides work basically for most of the town for a weekend and um, our Dingle is good like that too. There's there's always something on in Dingle um, most weekends or something on anyway. So he he's added to that and um, the quality of football is pretty high um, for for her preseason. Um, Dingle play it in every year and get huge value out of it. So, um, and then de- definitely the traveling teams come down and, and they um, they get a, they get some some um, some bonding time as well, which is which is hugely important in the in the calendar fixtures as it, as it goes on. There, there's not much time for that. So, um, a trip to Dingle is is never a bad idea. I don't no. think. And um, well, maybe the trip home. Maybe the trip home. <laughs> you think about that on a Sunday. How yeah, but, I, I did. I'm look. People might not know, but you're you're a publican. How has how has Dingle recovered post COVID? Is it is it back? Is it like you know you see on Instagram, all my mates, all my mates have been to Dingle since COVID. It's almost like it was uh, one of the first things that um, they stuck on their list. So is it is it back totally? Is it normal again? Yeah, Dingle's back. Yeah, Dingle, Dingle, Dingle was there even during the COVID um, period. Dingle was hugely popular as a destination, um, and as much as possible, we tried to put on. All the events that were there with safety measures in place and then where that wasn't possible um they were gone for a small while but everything's back in full flow now again in dingle uh it started off i think with the the phil and the Bialton last year the pagan rave which you, you might have seen and it, that was in the back of my place um and uh that was a, a successful uh festival and then from there it took off and we we had a, we had a crazy summer it was great the weather was super uh, we won the All Ireland, which added to the, the Carnival Festival as well around the town and the and the county. Um, and then there was Horse and Pony Festival in in, in August, Food Festival, Marathons, the whole lot. Um, other voices then towards the peak end or the, the tail end of the season, um, in in this the start of December and Christmas went very well too. So um, Dingles in in full flow at the moment and can only get better. Hopefully, hopefully, um, hopefully more people will start coming as well. Um, they haven't come before and. Um, and it, it'll it'll lead towards a, a, a guaranteed future for tourism and things because we've often relied on Killarney as a as a kind of a day tripping destination out of Killarney or um, out of other areas. But um, people are more and more coming out for two days and three days stays and 
and that's better for the town and it's better for the, the small businesses as well that will pick up trade during the day rather than um, just for a day or two. And you have dry January finishing as well next Wednesday, Paul, which should uh, <laughs> which should help as well. Give it a kickstart. Um, I, re- I read somewhere that that's the that's the millennials' um, answer to, to Lent, is it? Um, <laughs> dry January. <laughs> yeah, a cursed cursed month. Um, yeah. I'm sure you you had a team holiday with the with the Kerry lads before Christmas. Am I right in saying? So I'm sure that wasn't a a dry holiday. Yeah, we did. I know it was tame enough. Um, we went to Dubai and uh, Mauritius uh, for, for the bones of 12 to 14 days. Different fellas had, had different schedules and uh, it was nice to get away as a group. Um, and we we actually see myself and my wife stayed in Dubai for an extra day or two because she had to come home for the, the kids. And um, I just went on in for two or three days to Mauritius to meet the lads. And um, it was great, great to spend so much time together. And uh, we hadn't really seen each other either since the summer. Um, it was it was a chance to to mend any any um, any mishaps from uh, club fixtures and, and all that. So uh, we, we we two good weeks there now, and uh, fellas kept themselves in good shape. Now to be fair, there was no. I tell you, it wasn't the same as the holidays that they had in the in the zero zeros. And that's for sure. <laughs> Not as many stories coming out of them, uh, no doubt. Uh, we'll wait for the books yeah. when you all release books in five ten years. We'll, we'll get the full we'll get the full story. Uh, yeah. You had um, East Kerry, and uh, you know Dingle took on East Kerry at one stage. So you had the the might of David Clifford and Paddy Clifford as well, of course. So that that must have been um, it must be enjoyable to come up against the county lads in, in club fixtures. I'd say it's it's quite fierce during the game, and then you're all you're all mates afterwards. Is that the way it works? Yeah, pretty much. It's the same. It's the same as even in training. It's going to be that way. It's, uh, we're all competitors, and we all want to win. Even if it's in training, there might be bust ups and that. And that's so. Um, but no, it's um, it was good to test ourselves against East Kerry because we had a poor championship last year. We were we were dumped out early enough by Cairns Rallies. I think it was quarter final stages, and we were we were fairly well beaten that day. Um, so we were disappointed for the bones of eight or nine months to try and get back and uh, we started slowly in the club championship here and and did made the semi-finals but had a a sending off in the first minute that kind of cost us so Temple No and Dan Karen Jalis obviously beat them in that Uh, but then we got to to the semi-finals against East Kerry and probably were in in control as well uh, of the game with uh, I don't know 72 gone and Paul O'Shea came on for East Kerry and kicked uh, an equaliser from 40 plus yards with the wind and um, then Paul Murphy obviously broke our hearts then with a with a shot from I, I would say maybe fifty five out towards the the sideline outside of the booter and um, it's uh, it's tough when you when, when you're playing against teams that are capable of that because you can't you can't mark every fella and uh, even even though we we kept uh, David relatively quiet that day and and Paddy, I think he got one one or one two but um, the goal was a bit of a messy one where. Every time the rebound came out, it seemed to fall to one or two of the East Kerry fellas, and we had about fifteen fellas back there um, at that point to the to play. So um, we didn't get the luck on the day, and they, they they went on and they were deserving winners. They probably would say themselves they were only in second or third gear, which would be fair enough. But um, we played very well, so we were happy out and we acquitted ourselves well. Um, that's what we kind of went out to do at the start of that championship. But uh, when you get so close, it's very disappointing, um, and you know. It's another year gone, unfortunately, but we'll, we'll try and come back again this year. You had, fi- you had 15 players you, back there, you said. You didn't say 16. <laughs> <laughs> what, what maybe, you, a tactic, maybe a tactic for next year. <laughs> yeah, potentially. What have you made of the whole thing, Paul? Because it's, it's obviously, I guess it's garnered headlines. You know, I'm sure it happens in club football across the country, mistakenly, time and time again. But I guess when it happens in an All-Ireland Senior Club final, it it, it gets the headlines going and, and calls for a replay now this week have been fairly fairly heating up. What have you made of the whole thing? Yeah, it's um, it's, it's 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 a bit of a mess. I think really at, at this stage, um, it's unfortunate it happened. Uh, human errors. It's bound to you know we've all, we've all made errors. It's just unfortunate that it was the the biggest game of the club season that this one happened in, and um, uh, it's it's highlighted probably a grey area in the rule book that um, that'll be tidied up after this. But uh, I'm not sure how they're going to go about it. I see that there's uh, there has been um, moves made from Glen and and. Uh, and there's a situation to be dealt with, but hopefully they'll come to a conclusion that will suit both clubs and and keep everyone um, keep everyone content. But um, I just I just feel I just feel sorry for all the the players involved really that have um, put the put the year on hold and and uh, they've thought that the game is over on Sunday and, and this is this is dragging on a little bit and um, I've, I've seen that there's weddings and and other commitments and people are probably have holidays books as, as is usual. 
the week after All Ireland's. Um, I remember the Dubs had a had a week booked the uh, the the week after the nineteen final, and they all had to to re um re, re book that after we drew. And um, I suppose when when they thought it was going to be on the day done, there was there was fellas travelling and stuff. So that's um it's a, it's a messy one, and look, there's no there's no real winners out of it. I don't think so. Hopefully, hopefully it'll come to a good conclusion. It's definitely the topic of the week, though. Um, and there's probably more than just that in in in, in GA at the moment with the the, the rules that um, until they're kind of highlighted, they, they don't get fixed either because it's um, there's a lot of grey area inside there. So um, it's unfortunate, but it is, I suppose it's just uh, just the way it is. Uh, Paul, on a personal level, <clears throat> pardon me, coming back for the year, like uh, you're at a different stage of your career now, where uh, for the vast majority of your career you were an automatic starter first choice you've got to try and get back to that position again where um, you know as training goes on over the course of the week and the team is about to be named you're like very confident that you're going to be there how do you do that What what's your motivation to make sure that you're at a level that you feel comfortable that you're delivering on your own skill and experience and talent um, yeah look I, I, I've always said it as long as I'm on the field uh, and if I can get my body right without injury, I, I'm, I'm in with a good chance that I'll hit form at some stage. And um, that's my main focus is to get injury free and, and, and back in a run of training, not miss any sessions. Um, I think that's important, um, definitely for me. Uh, you can just get the consistency in training. Uh, the, the, the other few bits and pieces generally fall in place for me with the with the work I put in. But um, yeah, maybe maybe... Maybe it's slightly different as I am. I am on the other side of my career this stage, and and uh, that there's there's huge talent pushing pushing for places behind me. But uh, I just trust in my own ability, and if 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 what I provide and, and produce over the next six months isn't good enough to get in the Kerry team, I, I probably not being big headed, but I would see that as as a as a only a positive for the Kerry team because I'm going to push hard and. I, I'm far from far from finished, and my my um, my performances last year are a couple of minutes, and maybe the the semi final, and and uh, um, and one or two of the club the early club games. I finished strong in the year, and I played very well in the, the county championship as well. So I would say that my my um, my performances aren't really slipping any bit. Uh, maybe the spotlight is on you more as you get older. Well, I think that's a fact. If um, if a younger player. Uh, has one or two good games. They're afforded a couple of bad games with the minute an older player has one bad game. Uh, the talk is that they're probably done or, um, you know, they're, they're past it. So um, that's probably one of the factors you have to deal with. You have to be more consistent in performances as you get older uh, and then make sure that you don't have those bad days, which you, you're probably afforded when you're younger. I think that's a key point that actually um, one of the massive successes of the Dublin period when Jim Gavin was in charge was that older players were kept around and some of them saw game time, some of them didn't see game time, but it meant that the standards and training were of players who knew exactly what was required. So the the new younger players who were coming in were put to the pin of their collar in training and put to the pin of their collar when it came to upholding whatever the value system was to uh, drive the winning culture. And so it's a kind of underrepresented part of um, your ten thousand hours in around around Kerry squads mm. all the way back to your to your very start, like we're not great in the GA at, at um, uh, acknowledging that it's more oh, kick a wide off you go. Thanks very much. You've had your time. Yeah, I think that's I think that's true. Um, also, I think it's it's taken me so long um, to learn how to train and, and and learn how to fit the. I wouldn't say fit them all, but uh, you get what I'm saying. Like to to um, play my part in a in a team, and older players the same. Other older players are the same. That there's a lot of value in in um, in younger players from learning from that, and and um, and and up, upholding those standards that the team has, and and uh, we're probably we're probably less distracted, I would imagine, um, than than younger players that have. Uh, that have you know college lives and and um, different bits and pieces going on. My life is pretty, uh, it's uh, it's pretty boring at the moment. If if you if you if you want to um, compare it to some fella that's doing lots of different things, um, you know I I work, family and and football, and I love that routine. Um, I'm I'm very content with that, and uh, 
uh, it probably it probably helps that it's it's you know that it's it's a set thing every day for me and the routine is 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 the same. So I'm not I'm not distracted in any way, which I might have been a couple of years ago um, from other things that are going on. So. I think that helps as well that uh, that you might have those couple of fellas in, in the squad. No, younger players mightn't be distracted either. But I think <laughs> that um, the older the players, there's, there's probably there's probably more continuity in their life. So that will definitely help them. The young lads in the team have, have Pokemon to distract them, I'm sure as well. <laughs> yeah, and things yeah, like yeah, that. yeah, yeah. The, at this stage of your career, Paul, do you do you try and find, especially year after you've won in All Ireland? I guess you have to try and find motivation from somewhere, and not newspaper on the dressing room wall, but but a reason to come back and keep going. It strikes me that Kerry haven't defended an All Ireland since since two thousand and seven. So is that is that a is that a a real thing in your your minds as a, as a squad? You want to not just be a be a, a winning team, but an iconic Kerry team. Um, I don't think I don't think that's anything. No, in in our minds at the moment, I think uh, I think all we're trying to do is get performances and and uh, and make sure that we're getting the best out of ourselves. Uh, I think personally that if you if you maximize your talents and and um you're doing everything right and you're you're getting performances that the consequences might be the, the silverware at the end of the day and if you obsess yourself about getting silverware at the start then you're you're missing all the you're missing all the fun and and um the enjoyment of the day-to-day training and uh, everything that goes on in between because you're so um focused on something in, on the horizon that you'll miss what's at your feet so um we we kind of try to approach it with uh, with with just enjoyment of every day and and driving each other to 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 get it, to get performances every every training session and every every weekend. So um, that's what the lads will be doing this weekend. Now there's a lot of new guys in and and we're small bit behind the curve because we didn't come back until um, 28th of December or so. So um, the, 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 it'll be tough for the first while, but. Um, that's that's the way we're going to approach it. We won't be we won't be looking at um, any to talk about legacies or uh, history books or any of that because that's that's what you do when you hang up the boots mm. and you look back. But and, and it's talk for the media, but um, it's not it's not talk that we'll entertain in our dressing room. Anyway. Yeah, it's funny. Orla, Orla Farmer kind of said something similar yesterday. She's just retired, of course, from uh, mm. from Cork as a footballer, and she was saying, you know, the six All Irelands almost don't matter at this stage. It's it's nearly the memories and the and the years with the girls and the team that that, that she holds on to. You, you, you referenced earlier when we were talking with the Glen Kilmacud stuff. You know, the other rules maybe in, in Gaelic football at the moment that frustrate players. We have players on all, on the show all the time that you know have issues, whether it's the advance mark or other <laughs> issues as well. What what particular rules at the moment, Paul? Really get to you, or, or or do you look at and think, well, Jesus, that that could be done differently or better. There aren't look, there aren't a whole pile. There's there's, there's very little light change. I think the, the best rule that's been brought in over the last while was the the, the middle mark because it afforded uh, contests in the air and it awarded it awarded uh, the high the high mark, which um, Dave Moore having stepped on this week and left the, the inter county panel it was. Uh, was a showcase for for that that talent over the last uh, ten years, but um, uh, that was one of the better ones. And and then after that, I think there's a there's a little bit too much tinkering with with rules and and bringing in rules. And then um, uh, rules gone. I remember a couple of years ago there was five brought in for a league uh, Allianz League run, and um, and then they were gone again. And you know it's 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 uh, the, the frustrating thing is the. The, like the hand pass a couple of years ago, it was very frustrating to try and play, and they, they were looking for a clear striking action of the ball, which which was already happening, um, whether it's, it was fast or slow, um, and it didn't it didn't improve the hand pass. That rule has gone again, so I'm not sure um, why these things come in. Obviously, they're a hot topic for a small while, but um, the only the only thing I would say that that's possible would be maybe the maybe. Look, there's there's a there's a number of things in sports you could look at. Maybe the the um, the the basketball backcourt rule is one that'll be easy enough to to ref. And you have to think about refs as well when you're thinking about bringing in rules and how easy they are to referee. Because, I mean, that they're the they're the guys that have to keep all that in their head and and, and control the situations as well. So, um, maybe back backcourt rule might lead to more of a turnover or more of a pressing game from. From um, the the forty five to the sixty five to get rewarded for turnovers. Uh, if a team went behind the the midfield again, and it would um, it would maybe dismantle the the possession style game that we see a lot more coming into the game, um, which is probably more boring as a spectator, if I would say so personally. Um, so it would lead to teams when they get over the the halfway line, maybe trying to trying to get a score quicker, 
um, or the opposition team trying to push him back to to get the turnover. Um, and then that would open up a it would open up a defence. Obviously, if they didn't manage to turn over, there'd be there'd be holes from the forty five back. So um, that would be something maybe that I, I personally would like to see from coming in from using a, a basketball um, rule. Um, then I would always always have been in favour of the, either the two refs or or either the two refs or the the, the linesman having more uh, of a say in a game um, to help out a the referee. They they have a little bit of control at the moment, but um, the, the man in the middle has all all the, the call at the moment, and I think uh, I think in the in the big games it's no harm to have um, that little bit more help, and, and that wouldn't be the worst. I don't think, but obviously as you go down the the ranks and into clubs and into the, into the lower divisions of clubs, that's not going to happen because uh, the the the, 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 law, the man in the middle is maybe bringing somebody for the line or the, the umpiring, so that's that's a difficult one to say. But um, other than that, I'm happy with the game. Like you know, the maybe the maybe the, the forward mark was unnecessary to bring in but um, I, you can't say that it's destroyed the game and you can't say that it has stopped goals from going in because I think last year's championship had the most amount of goals ever so um, I, at the moment I'm, I'm happy with all the other rules uh, Paul I can pretty safely guarantee that this is the first time on the show we've had uh, Pagan Raves and Pokemon in the same conversation so. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds amazing by the way uh, thanks a million for joining us this morning best of luck with the recovery Yours. Check it out on Twitter. It's uh, it's up there. Type it in, and you you get to see what the the burning man was and all that. It's well, we, we might we might come down to do the show live <laughs> on, uh, the, on the following morning. Road, road show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all Cheers, right, guys. Thanks a million. Take care. What's uh, Paul Gainey there helping us um, remind everybody that the Allianz Leagues are back this weekend? Mm. Slightly overshadowed. Oh, I was going to say I'm going to Castle Blaney on Saturday night for Monaghan Armagh, and like I, I haven't got excited yet because I'm still thinking about the club final. I'm like. I keep forgetting that it's only two days away. Or, ordinarily, I'm, I'm at this stage now where I'm refreshing the Monaghan Twitter page to see if they and I have announced the starting fifteen or a squad, but not haven't haven't paid much thought to it. But uh, yeah, as of Saturday night, I'll be I'll be absolutely buzzing under the lights in Blaney. Twenty six minutes past eight uh, this morning. We're turning back to last night's football. I'm delighted to say Charlotte Dunker of the Times UK is with us. Charlotte, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, good. Thanks. How are you? Yeah, good. So um, the city ground last night, uh, 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 cup semi final. I think it's one of those. Um, moments where everybody kind of wakes up to the quality of the atmosphere at the ground. Obviously, Man United are in town in the Cup semi-final, so it's going to be good. But apparently it's like that all the time. Yeah, I've covered Forest a lot this season and the atmosphere has been absolutely unbelievable. I think it always sounds a cliche, doesn't it, to say like they're the 12th man, but I've seen Liverpool go there and lose and the fans really have made a difference for them this season. So yeah, the atmosphere was great. It's Forest's first semi-final there in 31 years so the fans were wanting to make it a night to remember but Manchester United in the end were just too good for them uh, I, I This is a, a bit of a tangent but um, it feels to me like the atmosphere is better this year uh, certainly like I don't know if it's just post the World Cup but like everybody's fully back understanding what it means to go to a football match the atmosphere at the Emirates is better than it's ever been obviously because they're winning but even the atmosphere uh, at Tottenham recently like it has sounded like that stadium has fully understood that they have a role to play. Uh, am I am I reaching here? Have football fans uh, recovered from their post COVID hangover? Yeah, I think after COVID, you've obviously seen a big difference because fans were starved of being able to go to games for so long. So to be able to get back in, but the teams you've obviously mentioned there, Arsenal, the atmosphere at the Emirates historically hasn't been that great. That's I'm not unduly criticising them but this season it's remarkable because of the run that they're going on I think if you look at the city ground the atmosphere is always fantastic there I think we've seen Pep Guardiola criticise the atmosphere at the Etihad this season so I'm not sure it's across the board that it's increased but you've cherry picked a few where the fans of home fans have really got behind their team this season the, some of the tunes we were speaking in our uh, pre-show meeting this morning, Charlotte, about the the music that was in the the city ground last night. You could hear it on the on the TV. Roy Keane was even referencing, I think, uh, Faithless, uh, Insomnia by Faithless, and Welcome to the Jungle. I think was another one. The, the tunes were absolutely banging. <laughs> yeah, it's like like a disco night out. But yeah, they try and create a good atmosphere in terms of like they were all there with their scarves. They make sure they pick the right music, that sort of thing to intimidate them because it's such a close ground in terms of like the fans are right there on the pitch. I think that's what Forest hope will, will give them an advantage in the games. 
Uh, Marcus Rashford must have been listening to the tunes just before kick off because uh, he didn't take long before uh, he went on that Maisie run and scored the goal because uh, I've seen a couple of United fan groups on Twitter comparing the goal to something Pele would have done but uh, and not, not like fan groups on Twitter to get carried away but I mean it was a brilliant goal that kind of typified what Rashford's been about this season Yeah he's in absolutely remarkable form that was his 10th goal in his 10th consecutive game and I think well Eric Ten Hag said in the press conference afterwards in the form that he's in at the moment he's absolutely unstoppable and he, he's right there he's playing with this sort of confidence that maybe we've not seen from him in the last couple of seasons so it's not that the quality's not been there from him in the past but he's got the confidence to pick up that ball go on that run take on two Forest players and then finish past Hennessy at his near post so he's definitely thriving at the minute but Steve Cooper was not happy with that Forest goal. When you look at goals like that, you always think, is that a really good attacking offensive goal? Or mm. is it really terrible defensively? Because if you look at the Forest team, they just seem to kind of be in awe of him a bit and they stood off. And yeah. that in the first half, the fans were get, getting agitated because every time Rashford got the ball down the left, there was no tackle going in from the from the Forest players. That They were standing off. They were giving him so much time on the ball. So I think a very good goal from Marcus Rashford, but defensively from Forest, they could definitely have done better. And I think like Rashford at the moment, and we saw the quotes from Ten Hag earlier this week where he's kind of hinting at Rashford and encouraging him to stay. And if United are to be successful, they need a Marcus Rashford in form still at the club. But the PSG links don't seem to be, to be going away but is the feeling now at the club Charlotte that, that he's there to stay for the medium to long term? I think at the moment he is just focusing on his football because we've seen in the past maybe he's been a bit distracted by other things not that the other things that he was doing weren't worthwhile but all he's doing now is focusing on the football so as I understand it there's not detailed talks going on about his contract that doesn't mean that he doesn't want to stay and he isn't going to stay but Manchester United would obviously love him to be there. His contract expires not this summer, the summer after. So hopefully it's something they can start, they can sort in the close season. It's not something that needs to be resolved right this second. So it's good that he can just focus on what he's doing and then turn his attentions to his future in the summer. You're right with the PSG links. They do admire him and maybe he could look at that and use that as a way to, to get himself a better deal at Manchester United. But he's come through the academy there and if you're Marcus Rashford and you see the work that Eric Ten Hag is doing and the improvements that he's made in such a small space of time and the fact that you've got a manager there saying he wants to build a team around you, then you'd look at that and think, well, this is my boyhood club. Have we got a chance of winning the Premier League in the next couple of years? Is the law of PSG really worth leaving? So it's one of them that he's going to have to weigh up. But at the moment, Manchester United looks like the best place for him. We mentioned um, Ved Veghorst at the top of the, the show this morning. We were kind of saying, look, it was a lovely finish for the goal. Roy Keane kind of talking at halftime, I think it was, where he was basically saying, you know, he, he mightn't score that many goals for United, but if he can score a number of important goals at important times this season, especially in cup runs, I mean, then it will, will have been worthwhile bringing him to the club. Yeah, and I think obviously there was a lot of criticism from different parts when they brought him in because. He didn't have the best record when he was in the Premier League with Burnley. They're obviously looking for an out-and-out number nine. This is a team that people are starting to talk about in the title race. Is he the calibre of player to really elevate them? But I think if you look at the work that he was doing last night, it was is more the stuff he was doing off the ball that I thought was better. So he's pulling defenders away from his teammates to give them more space in the box. He's some, he had some nice touches in the build-up play when they were attacking. He got his goal, which is obviously good for his confidence, but he's more than just about scoring the goals. I think Marcus Rashford is more of a threat in the box. Marcus Rashford at the moment is more of a goal threat, but he brings something to the team and distracts defenders. And Ten Hag spoke about Rashford's goal that they scored against Arsenal and Beckhorst's movement in that at the near post, which, which helped Rashford score and also the same at Crystal Palace so he's causing problems in the box without necessarily being the biggest goal threat at the moment so then if he can develop that into scoring more goals then it could turn out to be a savvy loan signing. Charlie you talked about the title race there do, do Manchester United feel like without saying it publicly do they feel in inside the club that they are in the title race at the moment? I don't think it's something that's been discussed I think if you look at the the gap in the, in the table we've obviously seen bigger points deficits overturned and teams go on to win the title. Um, but 
if you watched that game against Arsenal at the weekend, it was clear. I thought Manchester United played all right. They were they were in the game for the whole time. It was an, it was a good game to watch, but Arsenal are just that one step ahead. And also, you've got Manchester City as well. Like they've not been playing well. The, no one should rule them out of the out of the title race either. And I just think they've got another gear to go through. Whereas I think the feeling at Manchester United is that they've still got to develop. They've still got to improve if they really, really want to compete at the top. What do you make, Charlotte, of the Harry Maguire situation? Um, we've seen him sitting on the bench in, in recent games for United, getting no game time whatsoever. I know he, he was suspended for last night's game. Um his days are they numbered at the club given he's he's not getting on the pitch whatsoever at the moment yeah I think it's a decision that's going to have to be made in the summer and Maguire is going to have to sit down with the club and work out what it is that he wants because it's quite clear that under Eric Ten Hag he is not a first choice centre back is even a second choice centre back I think he'd rather put Victor Lindelof in if it was Varane and Martinez so he's got a decision to make obviously he's still the club captain Eric Ten Hag made the decision not to change that but that was quite savvy from him because he didn't need to change it did he because he knew that really he wasn't he wasn't going to be starting that many games so if Maguire wants to go out and play regular football then as it stands at the moment it doesn't look like that that's what he's going to get at Manchester United because there are too many people ahead of him in in Ten Hag's mind so that I think that's going to be a decision for the summer I, I can't see him leaving in the last week of the transfer window I'd be pretty confident that he's going to stay at Manchester United definitely in this transfer window but one one to look at it the summer in terms of Maguire and where he sees his career going and what he wants his next move to be and whether or not they'll be able to find a buyer to take the the wages off <laughs> their books it's mm. uh, it's complicated and, and maybe they just have to run that uh, contract out. I, uh, the the Veghorst arrival obviously does not sate the perpetual desire from the fans for big name signings and it seems as if they've done a reasonable job of managing expectations. Are there no signings because the executive at the club is completely distracted by the fact that they're trying to raise money or sell the club? I think if you look about, about how much money they um, spent in the summer, they spent over 200 million in the summer which was probably a little bit more than they were expecting so they heavily backed Eric Ten Hag this summer with the players that he wanted. Manchester United notoriously don't spend a lot of money in the January transfer window anyway they don't they don't think it's the best market to to work in. We've always been told that if a long-term target suddenly became available in January then they'd make a move for them like we saw them do with Bruno Fernandes and the transformative effect that he had on the club but there isn't reams and reams of cash for them to go out and get a big name signing, signing like we're seeing at, at Chelsea this month. Obviously, <laughs> they're they're using loads of money to to bring in all sorts of different players. But I think they do want a number nine. Um, no disrespect to their cost, he's not he's not the number nine that they're after long term. And if one of their targets had become available this month, then it would have been. A discussion whether they go and spend some of the summer budget now but that's not what's happened so I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see anyone else come in um, they've obviously brought a goalkeeper in, in in Jack Butland and then they've brought a temporary solution to, to the striker problem in with, with Veghorst so it'll be a case of continue, them continuing to plan for the summer and um, yeah I don't just don't think there's been the budget there this month one of the players that seems to be frustrating United fans at the moment, uh, Charlotte, is Anthony. And you even see Facundo Palistri come off the bench and, and even in his, what, five, ten minutes, he's, he still seems livelier and, and able to add more to the attack. And we all know Anthony is capable of a lot more than, than he's currently given at United. But there was a moment during the commentary last night where, where Gary Neville was, was saying, you know, he needs to maybe add a bit more of a, a Riyad Mahrez to his game, cut in on both feet. It's it's almost so obvious when, when Anthony gets the ball that he's going to cut in on the left foot. Maybe... It, is his game a little bit predictable at the moment? Because clearly United fans are uh, are a little bit exasperated by Anthony at the moment. Yeah, and you just mentioned Palestri there, and they're different players because Palestri's right-footed and hogs the wing and goes down and whips them balls in like a tr- what a traditional winger would do, which we haven't seen that from Anthony at the minute. But he came here with a big price tag, which makes expectations very high and it takes time to adapt to the Premier League. We've seen that with so many different players in the past and he's proven not to be an exception. And I think, to be honest, I don't think he played badly last night. It, 
Eric Ten Hag also thought thought he played okay. I don't, I don't think he obviously didn't set the world alight, but it was that nice crisp pa- uh, passing in the build up in the attacking play. Um, and then, like you say, he just needs to add that final product to his game. He's def- definitely not performing in the way that probably he would like and reaching the heights that he would he would want to get to. But I can understand what people are saying, but I feel like it's going to be a narrative that's going to stick around for a while and until he really steps up. The focus on a trophy seems to be paramount for, for Eric Ten Hag, and it's something that he's referenced uh, constantly in recent interviews. 2017, the last time United lifted a trophy, this League Cup campaign... It's being taken very seriously, Charlotte. And look, they have Reading to come in the FA Cup fourth round this weekend, Barcelona in the Europa League. But getting their hands on silverware seems to be crucial for United at this uh, juncture. Yeah, it's a really long time since they last lifted a trophy. And I think even when you go back to Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and he spoke about the importance of what silverware can do to a group in terms of boosting the morale and, and the belief around the team. So I think that would really help. But for me, I don't think they need to win a trophy this season to show that they've made progress under Terek, Eric Ten Hag. Sorry, He has brought something to the squad and he's improved them. If you look at how they are in the league, if you go back to the start of the season where they were, everyone was writing them off for Champions League football and people were saying that it was going to take them years, this rebuild was going to take years and look at them now, people are talking about them in the title race. So if it gets to the end of the season and they haven't won a trophy, but they finish in the Champions League spots and I think there has already been good progress to show that they can push on next season. All right. Go on, you. No, just a final one, uh, Charlotte. You, you'd mentioned the, the goalkeeper situation and Jack Butland arriving at the club. Has there been any more talk on David De Gea, whether he wants to, I think there was some quotes a few weeks ago where he wants to end his career at Old Trafford. I know his, his contract situation, there's, there's a big money contract there he's currently on. Um, and, and, and even just thinking about it last night, because Dean Henderson was the clear absentee for for Forrest, probably their best player, and he's on loan from United. Is there any word on the current goalkeeping situation at United and whether De Gea is there for the for the long term again? I think he will end up signing a new contract in the end, and then it's up to Ten Hag whether he sees him as his number one going forward or there's a different profile of player that he wants to come in. Obviously, Dean Henderson's loan will end at the end of the season, and then they, they, they've got to make a decision on him as well. All right, we'll leave it there. Charlotte, thanks a million for joining us. Cheers. Thank you, bye. That's uh, Charlotte Dunker there from The Times. It is 8.41. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. You can leave a comment on the YouTube stream. You can uh, text us on 0879-180-180 or, of course, you can get us on Twitter at Off the Ball AM. And we're live each morning uh, with Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Uh, John Duggan is with us. John, good morning to you. Jaron Shane, how is the form? Yeah, pretty good. Good stuff. We have the see the other way we have the virtual insanity sting with John's face up in the the clouds and the music. We should have a, a regular sting just for just for John's everyday appearances. Yeah, I just gotta, for a, well, I got to carefully thinking now of the sting because what that, would it be? Yeah, it, I don't know if it's going to be like Hannon's world, um, but I'll have to think of something. Well, we were talking about faithless uh, and somebody <laughs> by faithless was was blaring from the city ground last uh, night. It's a Don Juggin, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Something Don Juggan esque. Mike Anderson. No, more Don Juggan, I think. Don Juggan, okay. More, more bit risky and edgy. Right. Uh, so I'll have to, I'll, I'll think about, you know, maybe the Ace of Spades or something like that. Um, mm. So we, we would like to reward regular viewers with, uh, you know, the callbacks to stuff. But I was actually out the day that you explained Don Juggan. Oh, were you? Yeah. Okay. So I, <laughs> I don't think I explained. I just think I kind of touched upon it. Maybe I'll think about it and explain it. Well, yeah, I don't really need to do it now. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, <laughs> The seed is planted. The seed is planted. Yeah. I'll, I'll the, well, you should ask the viewers. What do you want? Do you want? Do you want to know the story? I mean, because I. I yeah. yeah. I well, here's one Don. I'll give you one Don Juggan story. I went to Amsterdam for my twenty first birthday, and I can't swim, and I still can't swim. I couldn't swim back then either. So, uh, <laughs> we we went out on the, the night before my birthday, and. Um, I kept on saying to the bar girl, I want a, I want a 21 year old whiskey, I want 21 year old whiskey, I want 21 year old whiskey, I want 21 year old whiskey. And, she, and we play the police, play the police, play the police. Keep on, you know, just make sure you do it. And by the time, uh, she's like, actually, we're, we're, we've stopped serving now. So there was that. Uh, and I think I got a 19 year old whiskey, it was as far as I got. Um, and the next morning, we were meant to go down to the Heineken Brewery. We were so hungover, we, it actually felt like a bad idea. So we decided not to do that. We decided to get a pedalo boat. 
<laughs> so we got on a pedal boat with a roof, myself and two friends, and uh, we were pedaling around for about a half an hour. And I wouldn't pedal because it's my birthday. I decided I'm not going to pedal. I'm going to sit in the back. <laughs> not today. Not today. So they got to do the work. So we went around the, the houses a bit, you know, and um, um, uh, with the pedal with the roof. And they uh, got off the pedal. And I was the last to get off. And the moment I put my foot on the bank, the pedal drifted behind me. And I was in a big leather jacket. And I went straight in to the water. And the moment I hit the water, I thought to myself, I can't believe I've fallen in the effing canal. And I got up out of the, out of the water again. I can't swim, I can't swim. And they went back down again. And then um, they pulled me out. So it was a mixture of utter fear and uh, utter hysteria at the same time. We'd taken a, we were really run out of money. So we had a 50 guilder deposit with the Pedalo people. Um, we, we, we ran to get the deposit before they'd seen the damage. And we did the legger then. <laughs> uh, and then I was... Um, we went back to the, uh, it was the Varmostrad in Amsterdam, which was probably the seediest street at the time. In the middle, All we could smell is weed. And uh, we were in the state of the Hotel Kabul. I don't know if it still exists, but I remember the reviews that they, they, they didn't get the most favorable reviews. It said that even Osama bin Laden would have stayed in the Hotel Kabul. <laughs> um, it was just like with the communal kind of um, corridor and everything. So I got back, we were all kind of telling the, the lady who was with us uh, about the story that I found in the canal. And she was so mellow, put it that way. That she was whatever, uh, and then uh, um, I was about sick for about a week because I don't know what I picked up there, but uh, that was uh, that was a Don Juggins story. <laughs> so there you go. So that, that's what that, that's one moment. So there you go. You wouldn't pedal because it was your birthday. So I fell into canal on my twenty uh, first birthday in Amsterdam, and that is a true story. You wanted your mates to pedal for you, John. Is that it? Yeah, I didn't want to do because I wanted just to, you can lie back and indulge. Yeah, it's your birthday week, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's enough. the thing, now, isn't it? Birthday weeks and birthday months. Yeah. Mm. Um, I think it's pretty cool, but uh, yeah. Right. So uh, I don't know what you want to talk about. Maybe the Rory uh, Reed well, beef or something. Yeah, we were chatting about this. Nathan was unsure at the start, but then afterwards it was all confirmed by the, the main protagonist that yes, everything that we thought happened, happened. And at the end of it, Patrick Reed is trying to steal the moral high ground by going, well, if you're going to behave like a baby. Yeah, like, hilarious. Have you seen the clip? No. Right, so I, I can show you this. I can't show it on air, but but it's only a, a ten seconds. Oh, somebody clip. has video of the of the, of the actual incident. So yeah. you'll see Reed here, uh, and I'm sorry for the folks at home, but Kyle Porter will get it. You'll get it on Twitter. Reed walks over, shakes hands to someone, and then he goes to shake Rory's hand. Harry Diamond. Yeah, and then Rory ignores him. Reed laughs, throws it, lobs a tea in his direction, and it's a bit awkward. Rory sits there in his hunches. It's very movie soundtrack, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and the Reed the way he just kind of there's not much in it, but Rory clearly just point blank ignores him. He for some reason takes a tea out of his pocket, Reed and. Lobs it towards Rory because oh, it's a live tea. Yeah, well, there it's you go. Live tea. Yeah, it was a live aces, team aces. Like that was a, that. That was just really. That was Patrick. Right, the second one was aces. Yeah. I just saw the live thing. Like, yeah, well, I don't know. I the, the, so he said that in his thing. He said, yeah. "Well, well, I, I just threw the live tea. The, the live aces teas at him. The aces thing has yeah. not registered in my brain. At yeah, all. they all play for teams. Yeah, they I do. Keep yeah. Forgetting this. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, they go team aces. Yeah. Um, we at, s- at Kyle Porter CBS has that video clip by the way if anyone wants to see it the very funny thing is because they do transcripts for all of the press conferences and all the tours and uh, I'll just read this out question sorry to take this with Patrick on the range yesterday a bit further but Patrick Reed said to you he shook hands with Harry wishing him a happy new year put his hand out to you to wish you a happy new year in a goal but short of approach to try and mend bridges there was no tea throwing he just turned his back, had a tea from his pocket and threw it down, disgust, as probably anybody would do when you approach someone and don't get an answer. Can you see yourself maybe one day mending these bridges with Patrick? Not at the moment, but he said he was trying to make an effort. And Rory was just utterly like flabbergasted and was doing all these facial expressions for about a minute. And the, and the response is on the thing, Rory McElroy, in brackets, incredulous facial expression, which I thought was quite funny. <laughs> so, he was subpoenaed, wasn't he? Oh, on Christmas Eve, yeah. So, I mean... You're not really going to shake hands with someone. This is pretty handbaggy stuff. I was thinking of really good golf beefs. I think Harrington and Garcia was a really beefy golf beef, which went back to the Seve Trophy in 2003 when Alathabal got offended because he felt that Harrington was questioning his integrity about replacing uh, spike marks or pitch marks or something. And they didn't speak for the rest of the the, the, the match. And then I remember uh, Garcia went, well done, Podrick. And then four years later, they meet him at the Carnoustie Open, which Harrington won in the playoff. And then a year later, they meet, which is, a, it's on YouTube. There's a brilliant video of the final round of Harrington and Garcia and just the utter glazed, um, wild-eyed stare of Harrington as he faced Dan Garcia, who's just sulking around the whole place. You've had Eisinger by Stairs, the Ryder Cup. Um, a really hop, funny hop one. balls. Mm. That was the That's it, yeah. And coughing, alleged coughing, uh, the, in an opportune time. Backswing. 
Uh, this is really funny in the time today, Ian Poulter versus Tiger Woods. It was 2008 when Poulter gave the interview that would follow him for years. I haven't played to my full potential yet, he said. And when that happens, it'll be just me and Tiger. Uh, the statement ruffled some feathers at the Dubai Desert Classic, where both men were due to play that week, with talk of the field quitting the range to leave him to it. Hank Haney, Woods' former coach later, added more fuel to the fire when he said Woods had dubbed Poulter a dick who mooched a ride on my plane. <laughs> Are golf beefs so interesting to us because golfers have the biggest egos of any sports people Golfers on the are, having done um, golf tournaments, and I love the sport. I love the drama of the sport, but the people in it, they live in such a bubble. There's no, uh, e- there's no other sport that has uh, they don't play in people teams, with bigger egos. They don't play in teams. Uh, you can't say that, Jane. Oh, golfers have the biggest egos of any uh, sports people. The footballers, I mean. I don't know. It's an individual sport Christian, as well. No. Yeah, well, certain certain sports, certain footballers loads have big of, egos, loads but of, all golfers have big egos. Well, but loads of kids, loads of 17-year-old footballers who make it to the first team squad all of a sudden have giant egos because like... John Ferraris. Well, massive confidence and big egos are sometimes uh, conflated and in, in the grey area in between, but I feel like every single golfer is egotistical. Well, well uh, like, you have to think that Larry and Macro are quite grounded. Oh yeah, completely. But you, you have to have a certain, and I'm not saying sorry, ego is a bad thing necessarily. You can utilise your ego to, 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 to bring about success. Everybody needs an ego in life to a certain degree. Yeah. Um, but golf, see, the, the thing about golf is it's the hypocrisy of golf because it's all so gentlemanly and it's everything about the, you know, the decorum and the, the, you know, the, the, the pleat plants and everything and the, the rules and all that kind of thing and being so nice and all that kind of thing. And then they act like kids. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, the other thing is they lose every week. Like, only one out of the 200 people who yeah. start ends up as the, as the winner. So, like, they have to... It's a bit like the, the jockeys, you know? They all, well, obviously, you win more as a jockey than you do as a golfer um, if you're at the very elite level. But almost nobody wins races ever, you know? Like, the vast majority of them lose. So I, I think there's a protective shield yeah. where they're like, I'm great and all I need is, my, all I need is the, the luck the point, to drop yeah, or the point. Yeah. someone to, like, calm my nerves for whatever reason. Um, like Skip Candle never won on the PGA Tour there's but no, I like the beefs because there's, yeah. there's so many dickheads basically <laughs> I think that's it like you know well everybody you would have expected to go to live did go to live exactly <laughs> all of a sudden gone I mean like there was another one really funny one somebody asked um, I do you miss could, ha- hate watching some of these tournaments though could mm. you could you see uh, your relationship with Sergio maybe and then Mark just goes no no <laughs> <laughs> watch it on the, on the on the YouTube golf press conferences are brilliant uh, well, uh, Rory's are anyway. Yeah, there's regular juice on it. Most honest man in, in global sport, Rory. It's and he, he's, he's never sh- shirks it. Brought everybody else along with him because it's kind of once you that once that bar is set. Imagine GA players doing that. Yeah. Well, we were talking uh, in the production meeting about GA Drive to Survive being an option. I think was it Declan? Declan Lee. Lee had it yeah. in the the Irish Independent today as an option. You know, would it drum up interest in, in GA having a Drive to Survive type fly in the wall? Even around the Allianz leagues or something maybe. Be a lot of lads sitting there saying nothing though, wouldn't it? That's the problem. How much are getting paid for this? Whatever you say, say nothing. Yeah, that's the, that's the issue. They're, they're, they're almost, they're not media trained. They're either media trained to the hilt or they're not media trained at all. GA players, which, you know, leaves a vast swathe in between. Do you know, if they're, too, oppor- media, if they're too media trained, they say, they say nothing anyway. But there is a big opportunity, I think, for loads of teams to get their message out and to get their supporters on side. And so that when, inevitably, again, because only one team wins that at the end of the year the, the supporters are more on side with that team because they've had conversations about them and with them and they, they've got to know them it's much easier for supporters to abuse team selectors managers players if they don't know them that well whereas actually if you're out constantly talking and, and doing stuff then I think you win people over that's my view as like um you know, if yep. I was running the media strategy for a team, it would be we're going to be you, know, you get your best speakers out, obviously, and the ones who are uncomfortable, you don't force them to do it. But you give them, you afford them the opportunity to become known by the supporters in particular, and you you do everything you can to elevate that, and you do content from training on your social channels, and there's just buy in. Then it's like so you know more about the team, you know what they're trying to achieve, and you know okay, so we're in a six month process here, we're working really hard in our defensive setup. Uh, later in the year, we would expect the forwards to begin to click, mm. but several of them are injured at the moment, and we haven't got the time and training that we need. But we're getting there, and that's a that's the process that we're on. You know, like loads of professional teams fail in this as well. Well, there's a reason why a year till Sunday is so brilliant because it's flying the wall of an All Ireland winning year. Like, thankfully, Pat Comer had the the foresight to thankfully to start they won. 
Well, thankfully they won as well, just to make it interesting. But even Kevin McStay came on board this year in Mayo. I mean, it would have been great content even if they'd way. lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah either Especially way. Especially if they'd lost that final. Yeah, 100%. That would have been brilliant. I would love to have seen that. Of course you would have. <laughs> well, yeah, for you, of it's course, as a, as a Kildare fan. But like Kevin McStay's come on board in Mayo this year and he said, yeah, we're going to be more open with the media. Like James Horn was a bit more guarded and that's his prerogative but yeah I love to see when the second time around I think the first time around they were yeah, they maybe, very yeah. open and the players were pretty open as well you know like because um, they, they were all brilliant talkers and brilliant communicators and they all had lots to say so John anything else? Uh, not really um, the Thiestas chase always worth a look at the race that stops the county in Kilkenny today 10 to 3 um, 18 runners Maybe if you want to have a look at one, Darren's hope at 12 to 1 might be worth a euro each way. I can't get John lying back on the pedal out of my head. I'm sorry. Neither can I. Or oh, falling into the. Many the years of uh, PTSD around it. <laughs> was it deep? Uh, well, for those moments it was. It's just my okay. leather jacket was weighing me down. It was, <laughs> <laughs> that adds to it. Uh, and Sunglasses also, too, hopefully. Yeah, and also, it's, it's kind of a weird story. Um, I've been given a watch my 21st by my sisters, and the first thing I was checking was my watch. Is my watch still okay? And then my watch was stolen then 15 years ago. Oh, no. 15 years later. So Thanks. there you go. Right. All right, lads. More from Don Duggan next week. <laughs> from John Duggan, you can get him on Saturday afternoon on Off the Ball on News Talk. It is 8.55 this morning here on OTBAM. And I'm delighted to say uh, Grania Walsh, Irish boxer and Tullamore's finest, is on the line, fresh off her victory over Amy Broadhurst at the National Elite Boxing Championships. Grania, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. I'm good. Uh, yeah, still trying to come down from the high, even though it's what five days later. But um, yeah, I'm enjoying my week. Uh, kind of basking in the glory of of last week's win. But um, yeah, looking forward to what's to come as well. I'm not going to get too complacent. It's seven days of rest, and then we're back to the grind again. <coughs> so, um, talk to us a little bit about it, right? What is the immediate aftermath like of um, of beating somebody like Amy Broadhurst, who's a you know very nationally significant figure in Irish boxing? Um, well, yeah, it, it, I don't know. Twitter kind of blew it up as this massive shock. I don't know. I think I was the only one that wasn't shocked, to be honest. Like, I know my reaction uh, when I heard 3 uh, 2 on the night, I was kind of, I, I was confident that I had won. But when I heard 3 2, and given Amy's name and everything she's won in the last 12 months and with my injury history over the last three years, I was nearly doubting myself. But, um, yeah, unbelievable. Like to to beat the likes of Amy, who's been in unbelievable form, um, and like I said, with my injury history, I don't think many people were giving me a a shout at the at the fight. But um, myself, my family, and my coach believed in me, and I knew I could get over the line if I stuck to the game plan, and I felt like I did that. What does it change for you in terms of what it opens up in possibilities wise over the next while? Yeah, well, these elite championships had a lot at stake in terms of like making statements. Um, especially for myself, because had I lost, I don't know what way it would have been back because of the fact that I haven't fought in so long. But um, it doesn't guarantee anything either. It puts me in as the front runner to go to the qualifiers. But like I said, there's no there's no kind of time to rest or or to dwell on this. It's you're only as good as your last performance. So I need to keep performing consistently and still in the gym as well. We're back to the high performance next week and. Uh, There'll be plenty of assessments and loads of sparring to be done to get selected. So I'll be kind of just keeping one foot in front of the other and hoping that I'm I'm on that plane to the European Games this summer. The photographs, Gronje, of that split second when your when your hand is lofted into the air last weekend are are quite incredible because you can see the the pure unfiltered joy on your face and then Amy Amy's in tears and she she leaves the arena then in tears. Like most boxers have experienced both sides of of that spectrum and both mm-hmm. of those emotions. I mean, I guess it puts it in perspective for you because because you've been on both sides of that, you probably experience and appreciate the highs even more. Oh, Oh, one hundred percent. Like the the win at the weekend, like was the best feeling. Like I was asking, like, God, an Olympic medal must feel something like that. Like that's how significant the win was for me because of how much I've been through. Like in terms of being told that I'm, I have really no hope if anything else happens to my hand because I've had five injuries on the same thumb so um yeah like that's why it just made it all sweeter for me but like you said every most boxers have been on both sides of three two decisions of tight fights like that and i think the the win was so significant for me but because of amy's form the loss for her as well like it, it is terrible that there has to be a loser but that's just those pictures sum up the kind of highs and lows um, of a split second of an individual sport. You know, if you're in a team sport, you, you share the loss or the win with 10 or whatever, 14 other people. But 
um, in boxing and in a lot of individual sports, it's completely you for the highs and the lows. I was just lucky that I had so many people there supporting me on the night as well. So to share that moment with them and there was tears from them. I couldn't believe how much it meant to them as well. So uh, yeah, a night I definitely won't be forgetting for a very long time. Have you ever had moments of, of self-doubt? You mentioned the thumb. Like To have a recurring thumb injury as a, as a boxer must be so, so frustrating. Yeah, it really is. Um, the the mental side of it is more frustrating than the physical because, like, you know, I think kind of pain goes hand in hand with being in a contact sport. But um, the physical side of it, like, especially 2020, like, I've been injured since January 2020, but the diff- most difficult year was 2022, even though I did manage to get away to um, a tournament last year. I had two fights over in Romania and won both fights, but I injured my hand in the semi final, which meant I had to pull out with the final. But I got injured four weeks before the Worlds, so I had to just like watch the whole team head away to the Worlds and, you know, win big money and I just climbed the ladder when I was just sitting at home. And likewise, again, for the for the Europeans there in October, I broke my hand in the first round of uh, my third assessment and that put me out of the running. So those kind of things and a big, a massive part of all that to cope with it for me was coming off social media because... I know social media has such an influence today. Um, but like, you know, it's great when things are going good for you. But like if you're any way vulnerable or or you know, feeling a bit down and there's things aren't going your way, it's a really hard place to be. So removing myself from that kind of atmosphere and, and just removing my exposure to it, I suppose, was a massive coping mechanism for myself. How did you come to the decision to do that? I think from trial and error of like, you know, five injuries and uh I don't know, just seeing, especially when I missed out on the Tokyo Olympics. Now, I do, looking back, hindsight is a great thing. Looking back, I don't think I was ever, I I don't think I really deserved to qualify for Tokyo. I hadn't gone through enough or understood the significance of qualifying for an Olympics. Like, we were all on the same path, but, like, when I didn't qualify or when I didn't get the chance to go to the qualifiers, I thought it was the world ending. But looking back, I definitely think everything is, you know, in its time, and I don't think that was the right time for me, but going there when they were all at the Olympics and uh, I definitely had to come off social media because you know when you achieve some people's like childhood dreams of qualifying for the Olympics and seeing everything that goes with that all over social media it was really tough so I just had to had to come off it was a decision I made myself and I've done it now for every injury I've had and if I'm having a bad day even I'll sign off and just limit my exposure and it's been a huge help for me. Right so you, you've got the willpower to be able to control when you're on and off because uh, like I'd say a lot of people watching will be like uh, I'd love to do that but mm. it's, just, uh, uh, it's difficult. It is it definitely is but like it depends on what you're, you choose your difficult like it was more difficult for me to be looking at all the things I was missing out on than not seeing any of it. Like I went away, I remember um, for the Worlds last year, I had, you know, kind of I planned in my head that I was getting picked and whatever. Like obviously I didn't take anything for granted. I was <clears throat> I was training away as hard as I could, but I saw myself there. And then obviously when I got injured, I booked a holiday and went away. And I just, I told everyone who was on the holiday with me, like you'll be seeing a lot about the Worlds and everything. So I just don't want to know anything about it I even think actually off the ball had contacted me at the time to do an interview and I just replied saying I'm just not in a good enough headspace to to comment on everything and I don't know did that seem like a selfish thing but individual sport is is selfish and you have to make decisions that are for your best interest especially when you're missing out on things because of injury and things like that you have to look after your own mental health first and I just would recommend anybody who's struggling with anything because you know social media yourself it's a world of comparisons and um, a good friend of mine once taught me comparison is the thief of joy and uh, definitely for me I just think when things aren't going great or you're a little bit vulnerable removing yourself from that world of comparing yourself to everyone else's life is a massive thing to to bring forward. I think it sounds wise as opposed to selfish to Mm. be honest. (laughs) <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> well, no, I, I think I think I was one of the people, Gronya, that you're referencing that was in touch with you. I think I, I was just checking there. Like I was in touch with you back in August of 2021. I remember actually thinking at the time, this this is wise beyond your years in, in in many ways because often sports people are thrust into interviews or social media, and and there's this aspect of life that people don't actually consider for for professional sports people. So for for a, a, a young sports person to to do that and to acknowledge the the things that are maybe not helping. And, and removing them from their lives is actually a really, yeah. really uh, mature thing. Yeah, well, if, if that if that message in itself could reach one person and they might 
not take the same advice, but consider like if you're really aware of what's upsetting you or what's making things harder for you. And then in turn, you put in place a plan to to remove that. You know, it, it just for me, it really did help. Now, it mightn't help a lot of people, but like, you know, even yourself with like the amount of time that young people spend on their phone, like, for example, coming up to the elites, I signed off social media for three weeks in the lead up and uh, I read a book a full book and I'm not a reader. I know that's not a big thing to a lot of people, but I had so much extra time instead of just picking up my phone and wasting 10, 20 minutes scrolling. I was just picking up my book or something like that. And for me to read a book, like is a, is a, a big deal, especially in three weeks. Now my sister could read three in one day, but um, that's an, just another thing that you kind of learn on the job as well. And um, yeah, I feel like I've matured. That's what I mean about, I don't think I deserve to qualify for Tokyo at that time. Cause I didn't understand. I hadn't gone through enough, but I think, I've been through the mill and back in the last three years and uh, I feel like I really understand and I've been um, humbled a lot of times. So, uh, yeah, I definitely think that I'm going in the right direction. So you are ready for Paris is what is what we're hearing. Yes, very much so. Yeah, very much so. Um, yeah, I think Saturday kind of put, I don't know, like I'm always, I always have a lot of self-belief, but I think with everything that happened Saturday and in the way it happened and like having a career best performance under the circumstances. Um, a lot of people thought because of the inexperience and the lack of ring time I've had in the last three years might come into play on such a big night with so much at stake. But I um, I just I just believed in myself. And like I said, my family and my team and my coach Dima have really believed in me. And I just think the Paris dream is, is more alive now than ever. I've started 2023 in the best way possible. And um, leaving the injuries in the past, because uh, actually I, I should touch on it. Um, I never told anyone in the lead up to the elites, but four weeks before the competition started, I broke my baby toe. Um, I dropped a 10 kilo dumbbell on it. So you actually couldn't Jeez. write the stuff that has happened to me, but it's made me 10 times more resilient. And uh, yeah, thank God everything just worked out. So, because uh, famously David Hay broke his toe and had the head beaten off him afterwards and blamed his, his toe. It's obviously important for boxers. It is important for boxers. Um, I didn't even think this was possible, but like I was literally out in the shed. I have a little gym out in the shed out the back here and uh, I had a bit of a sore back. So I was just doing upper body and I was leaving stupidly. I was leaving the weights up on a shelf so not to bend down. And then at the last set, of course, my luck, the thing rolled off and hit my toe. But I went, to, I went to A&E the next day and it was dislocated and broken. So they tried to pull it back into place. Um, no joy. So they actually said, we're going to bring you in on Sunday for surgery. I did not think that was possible, but they put a screw into the top of my toe, which I still actually have in my toe now. Um, and I have to get that removed in about eight weeks. But uh, it got me through the camp, thank God. And uh, fair play to the surgeon and everyone in Tullamore Hospital they were amazing to me and uh, really put me at ease when I thought I was just thinking if I had to pull out of the elites because of a toe injury and not my hand, I would have never been able to live with that. So, uh, yeah, I was sparring and all in the lead up to the to the elites with runners on what my right shoe had sewage pipe taped around the toe so that if someone stood on it, that it wouldn't it would take some of the impact. But worked out and uh, everything went well and uh, I got to where I wanted to be and the toe is fine now so All can't right. complain you'll be, you'll be beeping in the air, through the airport anyway with a metal toe heading to Paris <laughs> uh, that's the uh, thing I have, a, I have a metal screw in the toe as well so Jesus I'm like the bionic woman here <laughs> <laughs> well like it's almost like between the, the, the recurrent thumb injury and the toe and the disappointment of Tokyo it's almost like I don't, and I don't, don't want to overstate it, but it is a fairy tale story in some ways to, to to bounce back from all of that and then have the win at the weekend and then look forward to Paris. Yeah, it definitely is in my own head anyway. And everyone is saying to me like, "Oh, how did you get through it all?" And like the sacrifice and the resilience you showed and all. Like, yeah, times were tough, but like I promised myself at the start, like I wasn't going to stop until unless a, a surgeon or someone told me. Um, that I had no future. But I remember it was really traumatizing. After the fourth operation on my thumb, um, the surgeon said to me, like, Grania, look, there's nothing more we can do for you. Now, he was an amazing surgeon up in Belfast. Um, I would not have got through the whole thing without him. Um, but he was like, look, there's not really a whole lot else we can do. Like, we've done everything we possibly can. So, you know, if, if it does keep happening, you're going to have to have a real think about your future. So that was the fourth injury. And then in the lead up to the Europeans there in October, when I broke my hand in the first round, I threw a right hook 
and I was like, oh my God, I kept going, but I, I knew I was in trouble, but it was a different pain to before because four other operations, I had never actually broke my hand. Um, and then after I, I went, I had to drive up to Belfast to get an x-ray straight away. But the only two things in my head was I'm either going to be fine and get going to the Europeans or I'm going to be retiring and going to college. They were my two. I didn't see any other options. So it was the longest drive ever to Belfast, just the worry and everything. And then when I got there, he got, took the x-ray and I was just inconsolably crying. And he was like, um, he said that you've literally broken the only part of your thumb that's not metal. And he's like, I know it sounds like the end of the world, but it's not the end of the road. And that kind of stuck with me. I was, I was obviously devastated because I couldn't go to the Europeans, but at least it wasn't like, he was like, I was expecting to have an hour conversation with you here and I was to tell you that, you know, you can't fight anymore and that you're going to have to consider some other avenue because if you have problems with your hands as a boxer, you're found out very quickly. So um, I, I was, I felt like I kind of had a lucky, you know, a ninth life or whatever, or the golden ticket to have one more opportunity. So I'm still on that kind of wave now. I'm on that last opportunity, but I feel like I've left all the injuries in the past and, and the hand is feeling great on the toe as well. Uh, so, Gronja, the process of actually qualifying for the Olympics, what's that journey like between here and there? Um, so the first step on the ladder, I suppose, was Saturday night was uh, making a statement and getting myself back to the number one spot at 66. Um the weight category just suits me down to the ground as well. I spent the last four years boxing at 69, caught in limbo. But now Amy's kind of in limbo too. Like It's unfortunate because she's won everything at 63, but she used to box at 60 and then she didn't know whether to move up or down. So it's a tough position to be in. <clears throat> um, and like, you know, best luck to Amy and everything. I'm sure we'll have many, many aspire and many contests in the future again. But um, yeah, as I said, we're back to high performance training next week and we'll kind of, find out the process for the next few weeks when there'll be assessments what competitions are coming up and ultimately the the high performance team the coaches will make a decision on who's who's the best at the way and who they want to send to the qualifiers in june and um, so obviously i'm on a great great run form at the moment so i'm hoping to continue that and uh, stay injury free and just keep my feet on the ground and uh you know, if, if I need to come off social media now and again, I definitely will be doing that. <laughs> Jeez, I, listen to your story, Gronje. It's, it's no surprise that boxers have to do things like reading the book and, and taking the mind off it. I know you had been studying um, Italian and German in, in, in Galway for a couple of years and deferred that. Yeah. And Do you still, I know you're fairly proficient in speaking Italian, do you still keep at that? Is that another distraction that, that keeps you focused on something outside the ring? <sighs> I'm not going to lie, I should be. <laughs> and it's always, especially in the last three years when I've been injured, I've enrolled for more courses and like colleges I've gotten in touch with and all because I was like, I never really understood the significance of having a plan B until I was faced with the likes of, you know, you're one punch away, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I don't know. It's so hard when you're training full time. I know, and I know like people, there is so like, you know, we have only two sessions a day and there is so much other time, but it is really difficult to focus your energy on, on other things and meeting deadlines and all that sort of stuff. So at the moment, I'm kind of still in the process of trying to figure out what my actual passion is. Like I've um, been working very closely with a, a life skills coach and um, trying to figure out, you know, what I actually see myself doing after boxing because I kind of did see myself doing, you know, primary teaching or one of those secondary teaching with the languages. But I think with the, uh, with the, the wealth of knowledge I've gained through my own, hardship over the last few years through the ups and downs I think like I'd love to go on to help other people and may maybe not just athletes but like help other people to overcome obstacles and I don't I haven't really thought too much about it but I'm still trying to figure out you know where I actually see myself after boxing but I'm kind of working that out as I go I've learned so much in the last three years that I couldn't learn in 10 lifetimes so I'd love to be able to use that to help other people as well, if that makes sense. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. Um, and also, you're a brilliant communicator, so whatever you end up doing is going to be very interesting. Comments coming in. Dennis Ryan says, Offaly must be a county of poets. First Michael Verney and now Gronya Walsh. Most impressive. OTB continues with a long line of fantastic contributors and great guests. Lovely to hear stories. So the love is pouring in for you. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thanks so much for all the support. Like, it's been unreal since Saturday. I'm just thinking, like, for the last three years, my phone has been virtually silent. And now, like, after the win on Saturday, I'm just not used to, you know, the amount of people wishing me well. And, all. like, you know, when you're injured and stuff, they're really the close ones to you, see the hardship and, and they're really there for you. But, 
um, it's great to see so much support from not just Offaly, like amazing to come from a, from a community like Tullamore and from a county like Offaly, but from all over the country, it's been unreal. So, uh, yeah, hope to continue this run and make everyone proud. Yeah, 100%. Gronje, great to have you with us. Thanks a million. Cheers and congratulations. Thanks very much, lads. Appreciate it. Cheers, Thank you. It's uh, our newest boxing superstar, it turns out. Uh, 13 minutes past nine, it's Gronje Walsh. Uh, if you want to get in touch, we'd love to hear from you. 087 180 is the WhatsApp number. Here's what's on OTB Sports Radio for you today. OTB Gold at one o'clock is Cora Staunton. Leader's questions with Stuart Lancaster at three. Our retro panel is Sport and Irish Identity. And then OTB Gold is Brian O'Driscoll meeting Ethan Asewa at six. And then the show is live tonight with Nathan, John Giles and plenty more besides. In the ad break, you're going to hear a clip from the uh, latest episode of the Koi Gig podcast. Kathleen McNamee asked Karen Duggan and Emma Byrne which managers they would realistically like to see come into Irish football the Koi Gig pod on OTV Sports in association with Cadbury FC official snack partner to the Republic of Ireland women's national team up next we're talking tech with Jess OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio Ireland's first and only sports radio station Off the Ball Daily a home for your favourite podcasts from Off the Ball the performance rankings you had to be there the crappy quiz and a slight tangent and the next time he opens his mouth I'm the first one on saying that's Keen said this subscribe to the Off The Ball Daily podcast feed right now and what's the sort of coach that you would like a realistic sort of coach that you would like to see coming into Ireland and I'm talking like a specific name or someone that you've seen in an international setup who's done a good job that you're like yeah I think they might come up here after a World Cup or maybe in a couple of months time this could be something that they'd be interested in Emma? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are loads of, of really good managers. Um, it, it doesn't really matter if they're female or male for me, but I would love to see a top female coach going in there. Um, and I obviously Emma Hayes would be fantastic. <laughs> and she understands the Irish culture as well. I, th- I do think that's important, though. I do think they need to understand the Irish culture, the passion, the the roots of of where, you know, how we grew up and everything. Laura Harvey would be absolutely brilliant as well. She understands the Irish culture. All because they've all they've both had a drink with me, so they understand now anyway. <laughs> um Is that your qualification into Irish culture? <laughs> Forget getting your UEFA licenses. If you've had a drink with Emma Bird, you understand the culture and that's all you need. <laughs> That's it. You're in. Um, I mean, there are loads, there are loads, but I do think, I don't think you can just pluck one out of the air. I do think they have to have some kind of relationship with Ireland because, you know, we are a team or a country that play with passion and passion is probably our biggest asset. So along with loads of other things, uh, but it's a huge thing for us. You know, we're so proud to be Irish putting on the shirt, all that kind of stuff. And that has to, um, you know, it has to be in the the team talks. There has that you have to know how to motivate us, and that's certainly uh, something that an Irish person person would understand. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. Sixteen minutes past nine. Uh, Jess Kelly is with us. Jess, good morning to you. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, good. So uh, Cameron's also with us. Hello. Good morning. Um, I might start with Cameron here. You set up the piece that we did with Michael Darren McCauley mm. and Amy McGee. Um, how old are you? Uh, <laughs> uh, young. So your target market. Yes. Yeah. You're I'm buying in that smack bracket. in the in the demographic that um, Andrew Tate uh, and other people like Jordan Peterson are after. Mm. They're they're the ones trying to sell you stuff. Yeah, yeah. Basically, they're trying to sell me their vision of what I should be. That I'm not really, I'm not up to snuff in terms of being a manly man. Um, my, my condolences. Yeah, I I'm mean, sure you're. It, I rank, I'm not you know, sure you'll ever recover. No, and you know, yeah, it's a it's a tough road, but I, I think I've made my peace with it. Um, but yeah, we set up the piece because um, I suppose Andrew Tate is very much in the news right now with uh, the stuff going on in Romania and his arrest. We wanted to kind of interrogate why it is that he appeals so much to young lads, really. Um, what kind of brand of masculinity they're putting forward, uh, why it resonates, what's going on in young people's lives and especially young males' lives that means that Tate becomes this kind of prophet. Okay. Uh, and obviously this is all happening exclusively on social media. Mm. 
Yeah. There are some uh, live in person events, and obviously uh, it's getting amplified by WhatsApp and Telegram and the other various messaging platforms that you may or may not um, have on your phone. So, Jess, mm. how does this work? Well, like it's interesting that you, you kind of say that Andrew Tate's in the news at the moment. A lot of the damage that's been done and a lot of this pushing out of messages has been going on since before TikTok was popular in this country. He has had a huge audience for such a long time and he's had it on multiple platforms. And the key thing that's been consistent throughout all of them is his message. And what's happened is he has longer form pieces and then they get chopped up, as often happens with a lot of content, and the hot takes get pushed out on social platforms. He uses money to sponsor them, to push them out, to ensure that they're getting before the eyeballs of his target demographic. And that's one of the brilliant things with social media platforms is when you're advertising, you know, when you go through the steps to put up an ad, it'll ask, who do you want to target? So you could target 18 to 24 year olds living in Offaly. You know, it doesn't have to be in the, on the island of Ireland. You can pinpoint who you're looking to talk to. So if you're doing that on a global scale, looking to target a particularly young, particularly male audience, you can do that. The message gets out and it then becomes like a catchphrase. It's kind of like, and it's not the same at all, but like when I was younger, everybody would go around saying, saying like family guy quotes at each other. It's, it's, it's whatever your uh, sort of friends and your age group are into, that becomes the sort of common parlance and that's what everybody says. And what we're seeing now is the news has caught up uh, and you know there, there are charges um, against Andrew Tate, but this has been going on for such a long time. And what's really interesting, and I spent a good bit of time over the last few days reading through the terms and conditions of all the different social media platforms, they will all say that they have pretty much a zero tolerance policy when it comes to misogyny or hateful, hurtful content. Uh, but not only has had he been allowed to do this for such a long time, you now have fans reposting the content. And as of this morning, at half seven this morning, I went on TikTok and I looked and hashtags relating to Andrew Tate had millions and millions of searches. So hashtag Andrew Tate Band had 10.6 million searches and Tate Andrew had 35.1 million searches. There are also different variations of that. Then there are videos that aren't getting hashtagged at all, but the content is still there despite TikTok having banned him from the platform. Okay, so uh, they, they're they essentially saying we're a little bit powerless. They're, they're kind of, uh, you know. No, so what they're saying, and I can tell you exactly what they're saying because I've been onto them, right? So I was onto TikTok and what they said is that their community guidelines specifically highlight misogyny as a hateful ideology that we do not tolerate on TikTok. Content that violates this policy is removed from our platform. Andrew's, Andrew Tate's uh, account was banned months ago. See, the issue, and I don't want to be putting the onus onto everybody else because we know that these companies are very, very powerful. They have a whole lot of technology. They have a whole lot of people working on content moderation. But the issue is people like the four of us in this room, if we see something that we don't like, we can't just tut, we can't just do items on radio shows and internet shows about it. You have to report the content when you see it. And that's what they're, that's what all of the platforms that I reached out to have said makes a difference. Now it's very frustrating as a user when you do report content and you get an automated reply three seconds later saying we didn't find any violations. But that's essentially how you catch and try to trap the reposting of the content that's there or the content that's uploaded without hashtags. Because if you think about the amount of videos that go up every single day, never mind every month or every year, it's a pretty gigantic task. So I get, I've noticed on YouTube reels, especially recently, like getting a lot of Andrew Tate videos. I've never searched his name. Mm. I've never searched Jordan well, Peterson's phone, name. Your phone's listening to you. Yeah, the phone's listening probably so right now to us totally, talking about yeah, him. Yeah. But like, you know the way on Twitter you can click not interested in this tweet yeah. or unfollow this or mute this person whatever it's quite simple but mm. is, is, it, is it similarly simple on the likes of YouTube Reels or TikTok to, to just go I, I don't want to see this anymore yeah so there are a few different considerations here to like all of these companies and without talking about any one particular for a second all of the companies take a number of factors into consideration where the, when they're deciding when the algorithm is deciding what goes before you so it'll be things like your uh, age things that you've watched before uh, whether or sometimes it could be based on things you've searched other videos that you've interacted with it doesn't matter if you watched a video and you hated it mm. if you watch the video for a certain amount of time 
the algorithm will take that as a positive sign and it'll feed you more of that content. Even if you watch videos of people trashing this type of talk, chances are the next video you get or two videos down will be something related to it. So as smart as these algorithms are, they don't necessarily understand your feeling or sentiment towards it. If you look back to what the Facebook whistleblower Frances Haugen said um, numerous times in different interviews and different hearings, she said that Instagram or alleged that Instagram and Facebook took negative content as a positive because it got more of a reaction from the user. So content that would elicit an emotional, negative emotional response tended to get more traction. And I'm not saying that that's happening on all of the platforms at all, but I'm just saying that that allegation is out there. And I think, you know, you know that people hate watch things all the time. People are probably hate watching me now and they're going to have a go in the comments. Like that's what people do and that's fine to a certain extent. But the specific nature of the content that Andrew Tate and his followers and his fans are circulating is incredibly dangerous. When it comes to what you can do to block it and so on, so Instagram um, have a number of things that you can do. So you can block hashtags that you don't want to see within your settings. Now, I was playing around with this this morning and I didn't find it as straightforward as it potentially could be. The same has to be said for TikTok as well. But you can go into your settings and you can mute certain phrases, you can mute certain hashtags so that they don't pop up. Um, also then on TikTok in particular, if you comment, follow, like, or have a significant watch time on a video, that all registers as a positive interaction, so you're more likely to see that content again. So like from the research that I've done, it's not as clear and as easy to block content as it should be. I know Instagram, because I interviewed them a while ago, they've done a lot about protecting younger people on the platform, um, particularly around like, you know, anorexia and any type of eating disorder uh, content. They are very, very good at shielding a lot of that from younger people, but it's not as straightforward as it should be. You know, you should be able to go in saying, I don't want to see content like this ever again. Um, but in a lot of the statements that I've received from the companies, they're saying that we endeavour or we try to um, take that feedback on board. Is it not true that those sort of bans on certain people who are putting hateful content out there work, Jess? I mean, we saw overnight that like Trump is back mm. on Instagram and Facebook. And it feels, I don't know, from a personal point of view, that he became a lot less relevant over the last couple of years because he wasn't on social media. So like, why do they feel they can reintegrate these people back into it with these supposed guardrails when clearly it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, I think it, it comes down, it's such a tricky one and I don't envy the people making those decisions. In relation to Trump and uh, the meta platforms, he was banned for two years and they were saying that, you know, an assessment, I think it was Nick Clegg came out and said that they did an assessment and they found that he was no longer deemed to be a threat um, and that the public should be able to hear what politicians are saying. So. Donald Trump will now allow, be allowed back on to Instagram and Facebook. If he goes back, we don't know. But th there's that debate around freedom of speech, right? And you can't just ban people that you don't like what they're saying. It comes down to what's harmful. And I think in relation to Donald Trump, eventually it was deemed to be harmful. And uh, so he was removed. He was suspended. Um, as far as I know, um, Andrew Tate has been permanently banned from multiple platforms. So he won't be able to come back. And Instagram, I, I believe, have uh, they're keeping an eye out basically for any other accounts he may attempt to set up. But what you have now, like I went on Instagram this morning and I was searching around and you have like Andrew Tate fan one or whatever mm. it is, reposting the content and then also trying to sell me merch as well. Mm. So as much as Andrew Tate's the problem, it's also the people who are following, who are buying into it, who are repurposing and reposting the content. And, you know, misogyny is obviously dreadful and it's one big issue, but there are probably a million other examples of people posting other really hurt, like hurtful, hateful, dangerous content about a myriad of issues that aren't getting attention at this moment in time. Um, so it's a tricky one. Must be so tough for parents of, say, young boys who are like, you know, maybe not tech savvy, and yet they have to actively, before they give them a phone or a tablet or whatever it is, you know, tell the platforms that they don't want to see these hashtags or these mm. people or these accounts. But you can't, as you say, they can't, a lot of them are fan accounts, so you can't hide all of them. They all just pop up. So I, I, I feel so sorry for parents who have 
maybe no idea what to do in this situation? Yeah, it's it's really tough, but like I've been saying for years that like no kid comes out of the womb holding a phone or a tablet, right? It's yeah. something that's given to them. And I think once that happens and they get to a certain age, there has to be a conversation. But also the parent can't just go, oh, I'm not tech savvy. Like that just doesn't cut it anymore. Like we're all interacting with this technology. And if you don't know how to navigate it, you need to get on and try and figure it out. Like there are so many resources out there to try and help parents. Webwise.ie is a fantastic one. The ISPCC.ie has a fantastic portal for parents. And not only does it give you sort of screenshots on like how to do this, it also has sort of question prompts for, you know, if you're an awkward parent and you don't know how to have these conversations with your kids, they have prompts and suggestions for how to get the conversation going and talk through what they're seeing. But this isn't one of those things that you can kind of either pretend isn't happening or kick the can down the road. Because if they're not seeing it themselves in social media, they're going to hear it in the playground. And like I have nieces and nephews and I know that they come home sometimes hearing things that the siblings of their friends are saying, like the older siblings of their friends are saying. And it's not age appropriate. It's not okay but it does happen. Um, and I think that's always been the case, but particularly content like this is so dangerous. But I do think we need to ask the question of, you know, wh- like what need is it fulfilling for all of those young men who are following it? Like it's, it's a wider societal conversation that isn't going to be fixed if TikTok or Instagram or Twitter goes away in the morning. Do you know what I mean? Definitely would help though. <coughs> Definitely help to put a lid on it. Like I think the, the platforming of Milo, for example, that guy just completely disappeared off the face of the earth, largely. Um, uh, Andrew Tate's still massive on Twitter. They're still obviously happy to, to take the money. Um, but is it not the case so that the people who are looking for this type of leadership or this type of direction will fall into a trap somewhere else along the way? Like, look, I, I, I completely acknowledge that the rabbit hole of social media is super dangerous. Like, we've all seen, like, QAnon and all of those different groups and the danger that comes when people are just living in these little echo chambers. But I do think that if these platforms were gone, you will still find these groups will co- come together in different ways and it will, you know... Much smaller groups, much much more difficult to organise. I, I think the, the radicalisation of um, QAnon, for example, mm. has been facilitated and accelerated and yeah. amplified by the ease at which... So you used to be a lone lunatic in a small town and now you realise that uh, there are hundreds of you all across the country and all of a sudden you're meeting and marching outside politicians' houses because you found all the other local racists and uh, uh, the only way to do oh, okay now it's too late like mm. there are a million messaging, messaging apps um, that people can use to do that so th- that genie's never going to go back into the bottle and in fairness we do have to address the reasons for the lone lunatic who is mm. uh, radicalised into being a complete racist um, mm. But like the the problem is pervasive. Like it's as you say, uh, you're you're talking about your nieces and nephews there in primary school. This is a primary school issue. It used to be like a secondary school issue. Or um, no, I've, like I've read articles about um, like secondary schools in the UK and the US who are holding seminars now to try and de-radicalize all these young males who've bought into the Tate philosophy, mm. which is really really yeah, obviously really troubling. But it just shows the potency of the brand of you know masculinity slash misogyny slash sexism that he's pushing. And one of the things he does with his Hustlers University seminar series is tell guys to be controversial. And everything you put out there, 40% of people need to hate it for it to be good. That's the point. And it's like, he's, he, a lot of people have questioned whether he's really intelligent as he thinks he is, but he's completely gamed the system. And that's why it's so prevalent. Yeah, but I think there are other figures and without naming them but there are like even just within the world of sport there are others very 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 famous sporting figures who would put out that vision of like machoism and what a man is and how you deal with people and all that kind of stuff so like as much as I acknowledge that Andrew Tate is a problem and there's no question that he is it's not just one person it's the wider conversation of 
like a few years ago, we were all having conversations about mental health and everyone was so open and encouraged to talk about it. And now if somebody says, oh, I'm feeling a bit anxious, people just roll their eyes and going, oh, you get over yourself. Like we get bored of these conversations. This is in the news at the moment because there's a bit of drama, there's a bit of jeopardy and people can go and find out information online with the touch of a button. So it's great. But what happens in six months time when this case dies away, but then those kids who are maybe nine or 10 now are 11 or 12 and they're passing it on to another group of kids. So it, it, it goes beyond just one person. And I do think we need to have these kind of conversations. But the, the part of the issue is as well, like if we post this out later on, are we going to call it Andrew Tate? Is it going to be part of the Andrew Tate content that's out there? Mm. Because a lot of the videos now that are on TikTok and Instagram are people having conversations like this or who are playing snippets of his footage and calling him a douchebag or whatever yeah, it might yeah, be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, try not to boost the signal. That's uh, one of the one of the takeaways from this. So this piece will never air again and no one will ever see Bye, it. Bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Did this piece even exist? Mm. Yeah. I don't know. Jess, good stuff. Thanks a million. Um, more from Jess, of course, on News Talk. Uh, OTBIM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless... Do you have anything else you want to push? Or anything? Any, no? no, I haven't had coffee yet. I don't know. I don't even know <laughs> what I do. Too early. <laughs> We're going to be back tomorrow morning with Ronan O'Gara on the line, fresh from the praise bes- bespo- bes- bespoed. Bespoke? Bestowed. You were calling Adrian Nathan a couple of times earlier, so that, that's maybe not as bad. <laughs> it's been a long week. We all need coffee. Yeah, we yeah, all true. need coffee. <laughs> uh, his young winger, E.K. Anagu, was on the show during the week and obviously was uh, singing his praises. So we'll talk to him about that tomorrow. We have Jenny Claffey in studio for an Australian Open update. The latest around the world with Hannon. If you have any ideas for that, he's pretty desperate. He's asking us for them. This slot may have run its course three weeks in. He looks like a broken man. <laughs> Getting lazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fair. No, I'll come up with some some bits and bobs for the slot that everyone loves to hit. Right now, uh, exactly forty percent of you are hate watching it. Mm. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's kind of there was there was an obvious parallel between some of the stuff we did this week. True. Yeah. <laughs> we were just gaming. No, we weren't. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Mayo's Porik O'Hara. He does not look like Mayo's Porik O'Hara. Uh, here he is having a good chat with Richie on last night's show. Enjoy. I'll see cups. Porik, you're very welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me on. No bother at all. The first thing that popped into my head, I had a string of potential first questions for you about your own fitness, about this opening weekend against Galway, uh, about potentially last year. But he popped up on screen and my first thought was, what happened to hair? And, uh Got a got a got a new look. I know. Um, yeah, I got got rid of the got rid of the long hair just a few weeks ago. So took part in one of the Locks for Loves fundraisers for Laurel Inn and um, gave it the gave it the chop. Fair play. Uh, was there any kind of fear of a Samson esque kind of uh, reaction to the haircut that you might lose? It was your mentioned. Powers? Yeah, it was mentioned. I don't have that many powers anyway to begin with, so <laughs> I don't have the whole to lose. But Ash, look. It, not too bad. It would a lot worse. Listen, you're in a better state uh, on that front than I will ever be, so I can't really throw stones <laughs> in that regard. Uh, so fair play, and it was all for charity too. I have to ask you, I, I was going to congratulate you, obviously, and Mayo generally on the FBD League win there last weekend, or last Friday night against Roscommon, but you weren't involved. I believe you're carrying a knock. Is that true? Yeah, I'm hiding away from the preseason. I'm afraid of hard work. You don't want to go um, near the air dome, that's the thing. No, no, I don't believe in it. Um, but yeah, look, it was good. It was a good start to the season for for us in general. But yeah, carrying a wee bit of a knock. Got a little bit of work done just prior to Christmas. So all is good, actually, in fairness. I'm tipping away lovely. Um, fitness will come come along in the coming weeks. But I uh, won't see the weekend, unfortunately, now. But we'll just uh, tip away. You're, when are you hoping to come in? Because I know obviously we've got Galway coming up this weekend and then there's matches against Armagh and then Kerry are on the horizon then soon after that as well. What are you kind of targeting week two, week three? Not targeting anything actually. Okay. I am um, I just went when I suppose I had to get uh, the bit of work and stuff. I kind of made a plan with the, with the medical team that was like just tell me what I'm doing tomorrow and the day after because I find it a little bit easier. Um it just makes more sense in my head than worrying about a date and getting frustrated or trying to measure whether I was getting there or not getting there. So they're taking good care of me, and like I said, I'm actually I'm feeling really good. So you're kind of that, well. you're kind of that creature anyway, whereby you don't have you don't make plans in the future. You don't think about that third and fourth game on the horizon. You're very much a next training session, next man kind of game, kind of guy. Yeah, maybe for the betterment or the detriment <laughs> of myself, I don't know. Be that in life. Or in sports, but yeah, that's that's how I'm made up. I think. Does that drive coaches mad that you don't? They they would view some might view that as 
as a lack of preparation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But for you, it's just literally how you you best approach a game and how you best optimize your performance, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. You know, some things you just do subconsciously, I suppose, just mm. like how you've kind of grown up or whatever. I've been in sports, both team and individual sports all my life. And I just, I don't know, that's just how I found over the years kind of makes me comfortable and it's the way I go about my business. You know, it's good on the good days when you, you have a cracking game and you, you think, yeah, I've got it on point. And then other days you go out and get absolutely roasted and you're thinking, well, maybe I should have looked yeah. at the, the player a little bit more or whatever it's so it's, all depends on the result but like that's just the way we go about our business have the fitness issues with yourself kind of affected how you have uh, interacted with the new management structure there in place with Mayo because obviously we've had Kevin McStay come on board along with Stephen Rochford and his all-star cast I guess of, of his backroom team has that affected how you've kind of integrated into that new setup yet I don't think so no um, like I'm still around the place all the time still at uh, as good as every training session I'm not I suppose I'm not out there performing I'm not staking claim in that regard but I'm definitely there thereabouts you know bouncing around still engaging with guys and stuff and there's as you know in the intercounty setup there's a lot done kind of off the field too Yeah. so look I, there's no getting away from it I missed a little bit of training um, will I be a week or two behind people of course in um, regards to fitness and stuff but those things you can catch up on you can work hard on so um, yeah, we'll just we'll see how it goes there, but don't don't see it as a as a major issue. How has the change been? How have you found it so far? How is the difference between uh, what was under James Horn uh, initially for yourself and now under the new manager in Kevin McStay? How's how's the change been for yourself? I only ever really knew um, Mayo under James Horn. Really, yeah. you know, I done like a couple of months prior to that, but I mean, <laughs> really, all I ever knew was was James, and like I enjoyed it under James. There, it was good. It was good setup. It's a uh, it's a good place to be. It's you know you've just got good people around you, um. So it's it's a nice place to be, and you're privileged to be there. And now with the new management, it's class. It's just exciting. It's giddy. You know, there's, you know, change and change brings that kind of excitement there. I think everybody is got a pep in their step. There's a fire burning for guys coming in. You would feel that everybody's been given a very much clean slate. There's no real pecking order per se, you know, so mm. it's there to be taken, I think, and that generates, I suppose, competition, internal competition, and that generates good performance, really, doesn't it? Mm. Does that change the level of pressure that's on the squad? Because obviously, you know, if everybody's going to have their own sense of fighting for a place in the starting 15 or fighting for a place in the in the match day panel, but the uh, sense of outside pressure gets relieved when you get a new management structure like that brought in that you just concentrate on looking after your own game and impressing the new boss I guess I don't know uh, I don't know how everybody else views it but like the team is Mayo is still Mayo Mayo will be there no matter what players or management team you know will outlast us all so like objectively for me it's about succeeding with Mayo um, and performing with me also don't don't see it as an individual basis of trying to you know shine or perform or anything in that regard it's like uh, I think it's a, it's a good place to be mm. um, What's the, the, the kind of structure of the management been like because I, I, it's it's clearly different in, in personnel obviously enough but I think in structure there's a sense that things are a little bit different there in, in how uh, Kevin has set about different tasks and different areas for people to kind of specialise in in terms of the coaching. Give us a sense of what that's like. Um, from yeah, from my perspective, it's it's very very professional. Kevin has come in, and it's very very well laid out. It's well structured. It makes sense. If if you know, in, in very simple terms, I think Kevin's got a military background. I think he knows how to to manage and how to function and operate a, a unit or a team and it looks it looks really really good um i know my place in it i think everybody else knows you know where, where we're going what we're doing and why we're doing it so by all accounts yeah like it's really really good you mentioned the element of, of clean slate and that's i guess brilliant for everybody because there's no kind of baggage being hung over for for any reason uh, whatsoever from previous years as regards yourself uh were you happy with how last year finished clearly like you're not going to be happy going out when mayo did at that part of the championship in the quarterfinals but uh, for yourself you had been involved i guess obviously in, through the league and in that league final against Kerry and then up to you started that game against Galway in the Connacht championship and then you had to content yourself with i guess with a with a substitutes role was that 
as a result of what had taken place with Shane Walsh and Galway or was it just a case of James at the time felt like a, a change was needed in defence and you were kind of the face that didn't fit? I don't know actually we never really had a major conversation around it um, as a player you always yeah. you always want to start you know you, of course you do um, you, you want to be in the starting 15 um, I felt that I was actually going quite well last year had a few good games had a few slightly shakier games yeah. nature of the beast I suppose but um, I don't really know kind of where it went from there we played go in the first round um, again actually probably a relatively decent game on a personal level um, really uh, not obviously not great then on on a team level, which is far more important. It was um, it wasn't a great start, and from there on, it was I just didn't didn't make it into that starting fifteen. And like it's unbelievably competitive to get a jersey, a green and red jersey is very very hard to come by, no matter how good you are mm. or how well you're going. It is it's a serious challenge, and I suppose management make calls based on what they see or what they want or what they think and. Like I suppose you're not really there to challenge them. You're there to do what you can from the team. Like yeah, that defensive unit has always been fairly strong. I think and depth wise, it's always been there. You've got people like Stephen Cohen and Rory Brickenden and all that who mightn't necessarily have been guaranteed starters, but are you know brilliant footballers in and of their their own rights. And then yourself in there as well. But I'm interested to see there was no feedback from James as regards why you were kind of benched or anything like that, or you, did you seek it out, or is are you the kind of person who does seek out those kind of explanations from a manager? Yeah, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't place any blame on on him in regards to feedback or anything like that. Yeah. To be honest, he was fairly good. If you if you went chatting and stuff, and I don't know, some people are into it, some people aren't. I would always maybe seek clarification if I was unclear or something. But to be honest, uh, at the time, it wasn't it wasn't really the place or time for it. There, it was mm. trying to do what you can, keep training hard, and like. I would be a firm believer of that kind of action speak louder than words. You can go and ask questions or you can just put your head down and like if you're not starting, you're probably not playing well enough, you know, regardless of how you feel. So I okay, think that would be my objective would be, okay, if he doesn't think I'm good enough this weekend, then I need to go and show him over the next two or three sessions that I am, you know, and I suppose that's the that'd be my approach anyway. Things have changed, obviously, in the interim since that that quarterfinal loss. Um, obviously, Lee has decided in the last few weeks to to step away. Lee Keegan. Uh, we've also seen Oshie Mullen head off down for Australia. Did you have conversations with either one of them before their respective decisions were made to to ply their fail, ply their trades, ply their fields elsewhere? Not really. Like I would have been probably uh, a bit closer to Lee than than Oshin maybe um, myself and Lee on the kind of bit for. From November and mm. I suppose with the kids and stuff, and we just probably, you know, would have a, a, a good kind of relationship there. Oshin is um, an incredible character, and I think Australia will suit him. I think he could put his hand to anything. That lad, I, I genuinely think he could. You know, he, he, he's fantastic, and I think he'll have a great time down there. It does leave a bit of a gap, of course. It does losing the two guys, um, but like the depth of Mayo, you know, um, as I said, it's incredibly hard to get that jersey. You're going to take them two two lads out of the equation this year. It will still be incredibly hard for anybody to pull a jersey um, in that back six and in the starting fifteen. So like the boots are left there and they're left there for somebody else to fill. Um, we'll see who does it. You know there are, there are people champing, absolutely champing at the bit for it. Yeah, I get the sense that rather than people viewing within the panel either one of them as a loss, and indeed they are a loss people view it more in the aspect of this has chummed the waters for competition for places there and that suddenly Lee Keegan's jersey is available, suddenly Oshie Mullins jersey is available and, and the people that are vying for those spots are doubly determined now to grab hold of them and, and to keep them throughout the course of the league and the championship this year. Yeah, I'd agree with you. It, it is, of course, on a face value. You might see it as a loss, but as you've explained well there, the impact of it there's a lot of positives from that mm. you do you really do have and there's a lot of young, young lads kind of come in it's even put a pep in my step you know it you know lee has lee was a, a huge character around so was Oshin, but you know lee in particular would have been a, a real leader and we have loads and loads of them we're fortunate but like it does it it maybe you're going to demand a little bit more yourself again this year to try and maybe make up that ground or whatever it does to the psyche but there's definitely going to be huge huge competition to try and fill them boots. Mm. On, on the idea of uh, pressure and competition and all that, did, do Mayo get viewed too harshly 
from an outside of Mayo kind of spotlight and that there's always the sense you look back in 21 with that final defeat to Tyrone and different opportunities that have come Mayo's way with regards finals etc etc that they haven't taken chances that have come their way and that they've left stuff on the table that was there for them before do you have that sense within the squad or as a player on your own? No, not really. Like I think seasons, I suppose games go the way they go, and so so the seasons and look opportunities afford themselves. Yeah, sometimes you take them, sometimes they're taken from you. Mm. But I think the external uh, external noise is, I don't know, is it just a bit of uh, it, it? It suits media, it suits people, it grabs headlines, it gets a bit of attention, it it riles things up a little bit, and I think it's just kind of used objectively outside of the group, mm. but. In regards to the internal kind of view of it all, um, I don't think we see it that way. Um, a lot again, the, the team is so dynamic; it's chopping and changing. A lot of the guys that played that year in the semi-final against Dublin and then final against Tyrone, um, some of them had lost to Dublin six, seven years in a row. Others had never played them, you know. So, and that's again this year it, it, because it's so dynamic and it changes. I suppose the team is constantly developing and changing. Like it, it's not a sense that, that that stuff kind of seeps in because we were talking to Joe Canning on the show last night and he was saying that he was very much a person who if he came across a kind of a quote or a story from somebody who had made a comment against Galway or against himself personally that he would use that and that would very much be used is, is that something that's used in the Mayo dressing room or, or used by other teammates uh, I'm guessing from your own kind of the way you look at things it wouldn't be used by yourself but does that kind of stuff creep into the Mayo dressing room I don't think so. Um, not from my experience, anyway. Mm. Um, so as you do when you're when you're building a team, you do want to build unity and and collectiveness and maybe brothership or whatever, and 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 bond the team together. I suppose some, yeah, be well known that some teams will put things up on the wall or whatever, you know, and try and kind of build that us against the world complex. But I don't know. I can't say I've ever seen that in a in a Mayo dressing room really and I don't think it's part of the vibe maybe there are individuals that do that um, but not to, not to my knowledge people with scrapbooks and cuttings and all that kind of stuff looking through them looking <laughs> sure, there are. sure there are reddening of face in their, in their own sitting room just before heading out for training um, I have to ask you about that thing you did with Lee for, for Movember which I think is incredibly important stuff uh, you went out and you spoke about your own uh, I, I guess encounters with mental health issues and you uh, opened up about going to see a counsellor and stuff like that towards the end of 2021 which I think is remarkably brave and you should be 100% commended for that how did you find that changed your approach or did it at all or did, did it just essentially act as a, a, a much needed release valve for yourself at the time yeah it was it was first of all it was a, an incredible piece and we were really really lucky to kind of be given the the opportunity and funny enough like i hadn't even spoken about that or had intentions of speaking about that so they didn't even the, the team around november didn't even know about that you know and i was possibly somewhat reluctant to speak about it but kind of went the way it went in the end um but yeah look that was just my like little piece there it's an ongoing thing for everybody i think everybody you know we all have our physical health and our emotional and mental health and they like everything they go up and down some days they're good some days they're not and I just think it's really important kind of keep a check on it like I wouldn't have said that I was really at the latter end of, of serious struggles you know I, I, I certainly wasn't but I wasn't in a good place either you know and things had, things had started to go downhill and they were there for quite some time and that cloud hadn't gone away you know as you would expect it to so yeah look I sought out a bit of help I went and see my GP thanks to Thanks to a close friend, kind of giving me the giving me the push, which is really important. It's it is a really difficult thing to say. Um, I give this advice to people because I work in the mental health uh, area here in Mayo, so I do give this advice, but it's really hard to take it then. So um, yeah, friend pushed me a little bit, which I needed. Spoke to the GP, um, and yeah, started going back to back to counselling and even um, started on medication for a short term to just kind of alleviate some of the pressure. And it done just that, and I suppose continue the counselling still, uh, will continue it. I think it's very valuable. Um, and just the, the little message, I know I'm going on a bit, but so as a little message in it is you don't really have to wait until it is really, really, really hard. That's, you know, that really, was good. Really That's where I was going to come in. I was going to say you, you don't have to wait until things are at an extreme for you to actually decide to take that step and, and go and speak to somebody or, or to reach out and to seek a bit of help. I think there's lots of people who would have done it and would have done it myself, whereby you just... 
you reach a point where you kind of think, yeah, I actually do need to grab hold of this. And I think the fact that it didn't need to get to an extreme and that you did decide off your own bat with a little bit of help from a friend that this is something that needed talking about. That's I think that's to be lauded and that sh- that should be become that should become more common uh, in that respect. Yeah, it's, it's simple terms like isn't it? You know, mm. you like you have a little small fire burning and you you know you need to put it out. Where you can go and get help and put it out or do we just let it fester mm. and it gets to the point where it gets out of control and then you're screaming for help. Yeah. Do you know? Then you you're like why 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 wait until then? And I suppose society, especially Irish society, has kind of built that framework around us where we should be tough and resilient and like the most tough and resilient and honest thing you can do is actually ask for help do you know and it is a really really difficult thing and I applaud anybody that does but look mm. there, are, there are so many avenues to do that now um, so yeah and you would have seen a lot of it yourself because as you mentioned there are you still working as the, the social care assistant there with the Western Care uh, Association and no no I've, I've moved on finished up with them after, after seven or eight years there yeah. I work in youth justice um, in Balna and with Mayo Mental Health Association so I um, I work with a lot of uh, adolescents and um, then a lot of people from different diverse backgrounds and would see I suppose a lot of different kind of mental health issues and, and different bits and pieces but I'm lucky enough I get to do a lot of the community based stuff I get to go into the schools and, and, and do bits and pieces like that and talk about these topics exactly and resilience and the importance for you know having conversations and, and doing bits and pieces like that so you're keeping busy essentially flat out that's the matter <laughs> you've never stopped you need to give a chance for that injury to heal uh, uh, come here before you go I have to ask you because obviously it's been the tip of, of, of everyone's tongues the past few days this situation with Kilmacode and Glenn uh, just wondering for your own view on it how you saw things if indeed you did watch it on Sunday and how you think things will go over the next 24 hours and I like I'm the most ill-informed person on this. There was a brief conversation about it earlier, and I had absolutely nothing. I, I, I know so little about it. There, I actually I, I just don't watch football. Like I just don't. Um, got knocked out uh, by Lee and Westport in the county final yeah. in early December, and I haven't looked at football since. You know, all I seen was a, a quick screenshot where somebody said there were 16 players on the pitch. Didn't read an article. Didn't look at it. Don't really care to be honest. Uh, I don't know what's going on with it. And I don't know. <laughs> well, do you watch? I don't know if to say, but it's true. Like. Well, that, that's fair enough. It's 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 open and honest, and that's that's your opinion on it, and that's your that's your view on it. Is that you didn't see it? And I'm not going to force an, an opinion out of you. Not, there's not much point, you know, <laughs> sticking my oar in when I actually don't know anything about it. There's enough people to do that online. I'll leave it to them. Well, you know? that's 100 percent true as well. I, I'm I'm just like, do you not watch anything else? Is there any sport that you do like to relax and watch, like aside from football, or is it once you're no, once you put the boots away, that's it for you? Yeah, I'll, I'll play anything. I'll play yeah. any form of sport, any way, shape, or form. But no, I don't watch it really. Um, my young buck is kind of he's in that like super era now where FIFA and soccer is life, like absolute yeah. life. So he's he's ten. So I do kind of watch a bit of that with him. Got a little bit caught into the World Cup, got a bit of bit going there. But yeah. besides that, like I've no no interest in it really. Might watch a little bit of basketball, but no, not yeah. really. Does does he does, so have you managed to actually play FIFA with the ten year old then and, and how badly does he beat you on a regular basis? Because I've got an eleven year old and I can't compete. Yeah, I'm like I'm on the fringes. Do you know when you're at the line? Yeah. When when you when you finally know, okay, it's coming. Like he's he's about to take over and there will be no coming back. That's where I'm at right now. I'm hanging on by yeah. dear life. <laughs> yeah, it's a scary it's a scary point uh, that I think we all reach in certain bleak parts bleak of our life. Yeah. It really, really is. Uh, listen, Porrig, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to talk to you. And of course, it's all been with thanks to Allianz and the start of the Allianz League, which return this weekend. Porrig O'Hara, uh, thanks so much for speaking to us this afternoon and this evening. And uh, our Gaelic football and off the ball is in partnership with AIB, proud sponsors of the Football Hurling and Camogie All-Ireland Club Championships. Check out hashtag the toughest for more. Pod- OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. OTB.